Keeping up with the fast-paced advancements in AI and web development is not only necessary, but crucial. You must stay informed about where the industry is heading and what new technologies are being released. In 2013, Facebook introduced React, a groundbreaking technology that revolutionized web development and created countless job opportunities. Fast forward to 2023, and believe it or not, the official React documentation now suggests never to use plain React again. Instead, it recommends to build new apps by picking one of the React-powered frameworks popular in the community. Interestingly, the first framework that they recommend is none other than Next.js. And for that reason, I have prepared a special paid resource you can get completely for free, the Ultimate Next.js 13 ebook that covers everything you need to know to become a professional Next.js developer. This ebook will cover the complete Next.js roadmap, the essential Next.js concepts, new Next 13 features, extensive guidance on building scalable projects from scratch, and project ideas you can build and deploy to put on your portfolio and get a job. This ebook will be the most comprehensive resource we have ever created. So it will be a paid premium ebook. Thankfully, the first 1,000 people on the waiting list get it completely for free in an upcoming newsletter. Sign up right now via the link in the description not to miss out. If you're wondering whether companies are transitioning to Next.js and whether you should start learning it, the answer to both of these questions is a strong yes. Node.js recently tweeted that they have migrated the Node.js website to Next.js for the long term, indicating that there is a shift towards using Next.js among companies. But that's not all. Many huge companies such as Netflix, TikTok, Twitch, Hulu, Notion, Target, and even Nike have adopted Next.js to develop their websites. The momentum of Next.js is remarkable. In upcoming months, you can expect to witness an increase in Next.js job opportunities like never before. Therefore, this is an ideal moment for you to acquire your Next.js skills and show the potential employers that you are prepared. And the best way to do that is to build your own modern Next 13 full stack application. Yep, you heard that right. First, we're going to go through the crash course. And then immediately after, we'll put all of your skills to the test by building this phenomenal application. With the popularity of ChatGPT, we find ourselves more and more in need for really specific AI prompts. This application allows you to discover and share different prompts. So you can search for them, create your own prompts, delete them, check out different people's profiles, and much more. As I said, full stack CRUD Next 13 application that you will build. So stay tuned and let's dive right in. Let me start with a very important first question. What does Next.js have that React doesn't? In simple words, Next.js simplifies the development process and on top of that, it optimizes your web applications. It does that through its primary features. Let's explore them one by one. First on the list, rendering. It all begins with the rendering process. The primary distinction between React.js and Next.js lies in how they handle rendering. You may already know that React.js renders user interface on the client side, while Next.js performs server-side rendering. However, Next.js offers flexibility in rendering options. You can choose to render the UI on the client side or the server side according to your needs. Of course, the main question is, what is client-side and server-side rendering and which one is better? Client-side rendering or browser rendering happens on the client's device or the browser. When a user requests a web page, the server sends a basic HTML document and JavaScript code. The browser then downloads and executes the JavaScript code, which leads to the rendering of components and finally the display of the website. 
On the other hand, server-side rendering involves rendering the web page on the server before transmitting it to the client's device. When a user requests a page, the server processes the request and renders the components on the server side. The server then sends back the fully rendered HTML to the client's browser, enabling immediate display. This distinction highlights an essential aspect of web development, SEO, search engine optimization. Search engine crawlers face difficulties indexing pages dynamically rendered on the client side. As a result, the SEO performance of such pages may suffer, as search engines may not fully comprehend their content and rank them appropriately. By utilizing Next.js, this issue is resolved by sending pre-rendered code directly to the client. This enables easy crawling and indexing by search engines, leading to the improved SEO. But now you might wonder, why should I prioritize SEO? SEO is crucial for optimizing websites' visibility and ranking in search engine results. By focusing on SEO, you can achieve several benefits, including increased organic traffic, enhanced user experience, credibility and trustworthiness, and competitive advantage due to higher search result rankings. Prioritizing SEO can greatly impact the success of your website and its online presence. The second great Next.js feature is routing. How do we create different page routes in React? We have to install an additional package called React Router DOM and then create routes in one of the files. That's pretty simple, right? But then how do we create routes in Next.js? Next.js uses a file-based routing system, which means that the routing is handled by the file system. Each folder in the app directory becomes a route, and the folder name becomes the route's path. For example, if you have a folder named about in the app directory, you can access that page at the forward slash about path. Isn't that so easy? No need for external packages or complex configurations. You can create files for the routes you want and immediately open them within your application. Of course, we're gonna explore this in much more detail later on once we dive into the build of our own Next.js application. Another huge Next.js feature is its ability to create full stack applications. From Next.js version nine, developers behind Next introduced a new feature called API routes, enabling the creation of serverless functions to handle API requests. Serverless APIs in Next.js are a way of creating API endpoints without the need for a traditional server. It allows us to build and deploy APIs without managing server infrastructure or worrying about scaling your server as the traffic increases. With this feature, you can create an API endpoint by simply creating a file called route.js in a specific folder within the app directory. This file in any route segment of the app directly corresponds to that route API endpoint. Once again, we're gonna dive deeper into that once we move to a real project. One of the vice presidents of developer experience at Vercel, Lee Robinson, mentioned in his blog post that moving from a typical React Express Webpack backend to Next.js resulted in removing 20 plus thousand lines of code and 30 plus dependencies while improving hot module reloading from 1.3 seconds to 131 milliseconds, which is 10 times less. Of course, in the demo that follows, I'm gonna show you how to utilize Next.js's full stack capabilities. The next feature on our list of awesome Next.js features is automatic code splitting. Code splitting is a technique that breaks down large bundles of JavaScript code into smaller, more manageable chunks that can be loaded as needed. That's the keyword here, when needed. This reduces the initial load time of a website and optimizes the user's experience while browsing. 
While we can achieve code splitting in React, the process is manual. We have to do lots of configuration as your application grows. For example, we need to use the lazy function from React to dynamically import the about component only when it's needed. We also use the suspense component to show a fallback UI when the component is being loaded. But in Next.js, this process is entirely automatic, no need for any code. It uses automatic code splitting by default to split pages into separate chunks. When a user navigates to another page, only the code required for that page is loaded, resulting in faster subsequent page navigations. So what's the takeaway? Front-end development has gone through various advancements in areas like linting, formatting, compiling, bundling, minifying, deploying, and many more. However, to avoid the time spent configuring these tools, developers felt a need for a framework that would take care of most of the process automatically, leaving them to concentrate on the actual code. That's where Next.js comes in, automating most of the remaining processes and letting us focus on building the essential business logic of the application. And for the end, Next.js's final advantage. It's still just React. Next.js is not an entirely new technology. It is still fundamentally built on top of React. Its purpose is to simplify certain tasks, allowing developers to concentrate on the core React code. Next.js manages a variety of features, such as routing, code splitting, search engine optimization, and rendering automatically. This automation saves a considerable amount of time, reducing the effort required to build a React application from the ground up. To put it simply, Next.js is an extension of React that streamlines the development process by automating several functions, allowing developers to focus on what they do best, writing React code. In the end, it's all React. And with that said, hopefully you're now hooked for what Next.js has to offer. And in the typical JavaScript mastery style, we are now ready to transition from plain theory to actually building your own simple Next.js application with its newest version, including all of its primary features. Think of it as a one-stop shop for fully understanding and implementing all of these features on your own. Let's get started. Now, let's set up the project that we'll be working on in this video. I'll first provide a practical explanation of all of these features, after which we'll immediately begin working on the project. To get started, you can create a new folder on your desktop and call it something like share underscore prompts. Because in your app, you'll be able to share great prompts that people can use within ChatGPT. Finally, open up an empty Visual Studio Code window and then drag and drop your empty folder in. Within your VS Code, go to View and then Terminal. This is going to open up an integrated Visual Studio Code terminal. Inside of there, you want to type mpx create-next-app add latest and then type dot slash. This will ensure to create your next application within the current repository. Now you could get a prompt to say, hey, do you want to install create next app? Simply press enter to say yes. After that, it's going to ask you, would you like to use TypeScript on this project? Let's say no. Would you like to use ESLint? In this case, we're going to also say no. Would you like to use Tailwind? We're going to say yes, we do. Then it's going to ask you, would you like to use the SRC directory? In this case, we're going to say no. And then it's going to ask you, would you like to use the experimental app directory with this project? In this case, we want to say yes because this feature won't be experimental for too long. The Next.js team has plans to launch it as a stable version in a couple of months. So let's say yes. Hi there, Adrian here. While I was editing this video, Next released a new update 14 hours ago, Next.js 13.4. This version marked the stability for the app router, making it completely stable. 
That's gonna include React server components, nested routes and layouts, simplified data fetching, streaming and suspense, and built-in SEO. All of the features that are included in today's video. But I just wanted to say that you will no longer get that question, experimental app directory, because now it is stable. So this is great news. Keep on going with the video and have a great time. And then it's gonna ask you, what import alias would you like to configure? Import aliases are shortcuts that allow you to refer to a module or a file using a custom name instead of its full path. This can help simplify and clarify your code, especially when working with complex file structures. So let's simply press enter. Great. And immediately, the installation process has begun and the project is now ready. As I discuss different features, I will revisit this project to demonstrate some parts in action. So please follow along. First, we're gonna do a deep dive into the structure of the Next.js application. When you explore the files in Next.js, you will come across the app folder, which is the most important folder in our Next.js app. And then inside of there, you will see layout.js, page.js, and then the globals.css. These are the most important files for now. The layout.js file is the main entry point of our application. And all of the components are wrapped within it as its children. As a result, any code you write within this file, such as a p tag, hello world, will be displayed on every route page you create. This unique file enables you to personalize the behavior of your application by providing a common layout or template for all of the pages. Any components you include in this file will be shared throughout your entire application. If we dive into the Next.js documentation on layouts, we can see a really simple example that explains what the layout is for. It simply takes all the children and then you can place some of the components you wanna reuse across all routes. In most cases, that's gonna be your navbar and footer. Additionally, the layout.js file also allows you to customize the appearance of your HTML document. So you can set things like language and you can also modify the metadata for all the pages, as well as add script tags, links, or even fonts as it is done in this case. In a nutshell, if you want to add something that should stay consistent across all routes, such as navbar, footer, or Redux toolkit wrapper, you should place it in the layout.js file. Next to the layout, we have the page.js file. The purpose of the page.js file is that it simply represents the home page route of the application, i.e. it's what you see if you go to localhost 3000 forward slash. That is the page you see once you visit. In this case, it's just a typical boilerplate code. And next to the page, we have the globals.css. That file contains the global CSS styles of the entire application. In here, you can see that it has been imported within the layout file so that every single route inherits it. As you can see in here, we have the Tailwind imports, which will help us utilize Tailwind within our application. Now, this page that you can see right here, even though it looks like a normal React functional component, it is being rendered as something known as a server-side component. React 18 and Next 13 introduced new ways to rendering your components. They are two environments where your application code can be rendered, the client and the server. By default, all components created in Next.js within the app folder are React server components, which means that Next.js leverages server-side rendering to enhance the initial page loading speed, resulting in improved SEO and user experience. Now, in case you wanna turn that server-side component by default into a client-side one, you need to add the use client directive to the top of your page to turn it into a client-side component. Using both the client components and the server components allows us to leverage the benefits of server-side rendering while still utilizing React's capabilities for building dynamic 
and interactive user interfaces. This is an example of a typical server-side component. It is a simple component consisting of a navigation bar that has a logo and a search bar. It also has some main content with a P tag. As you can see, there is no use client directive, which means that this is a server-side component. Now, as discussed, to turn this into a client-side component, we need to use client on top. Whenever you're utilizing state or hooks like use state in React or other client-side management solutions, it is important to declare the component as a client-side component. State management in React is primarily handled on the client side, where the component state is managed and updated within the browser. So if you're using any of the React hooks, use state, use effect, or anything similar, you need to add the use client on top. Otherwise, you're going to run into errors. Now, the most logical question you might have for me now is, when should I use server components? And when should I transform them to client ones? Thankfully, Next.js's documentation page answers just that question. To simplify the decision between server and client components, we recommend using server components default in the app directory until you have a need to use a client component. Essentially, just keep doing what you're doing. When you have an error, just transform it into a use client component. Now, just below, they provide us with a table that explains on when you might want to use server components and when to use client components. Whenever you're fetching any data like article, blog posts, or website data, you want to use server-side components. Whenever you access any backend resources directly, use server-side. Whenever you have any sensitive information on the server, access tokens, API keys, use server-side components and whenever you want to reduce the client-side JavaScript. Now, when should you use client-side components? When you have some interactivity or event listeners, such as on click or on change. In that case, make it a client-side. Whenever you're using use state and lifecycle effects, use state, use reducer, use effect, use client-side. Whenever you use some custom hooks that depend on state effects or browser-only APIs, or if you use React class components. I hope that this provided you with just a bit of clarity on when you should use server and when client-side components. To put it in simple words, just let Next.js do its thing, out of the box, make it server-side, but then when you want to use some React capabilities like use state, use effect, or interactivity, then simply add that use client string on top. It is as simple as that. Now, let's focus on Next.js's routing system. All you need to do to implement the routing in Next.js is create a folder corresponding to the desired route within the app folder. The name of the folder will serve as the route name. For instance, let's say that you want to create a forward slash user route. Simply navigate to the app folder, create a new folder called user, and then within it, simply create a new page.js file. Within this file, you can create a React functional component. And this hello user div is going to be displayed from localhost 3000 forward slash user. It is as simple as that. Now, let's do something more complicated. We can delete this user folder. And suppose we are developing a blog application that requires different routes for different functionalities. These include displaying all posts in the forward slash posts route, and then also creating a new post on the forward slash post forward slash new. That is something known as nested routing. And in React.js, without Next.js, it would look something like this. You have to import all of these pages, import React Router DOM, create the router and the routes, specify the routes that are right on the root route, and then you have to create the nested route as well. So in this case, we have the forward slash posts, and then also forward slash posts, forward slash new. A little complicated, isn't it? 
Now, let's try to create the same structure in Next.js. All we have to do is nest folder within each other. To achieve this routing, let's create a new folder in the app folder called posts. There, we said we're going to have a page that displays all posts. So we can say page.js, render a new React component, and then in here, we're going to render all of the posts. But now, what if we want to create a new nested route for creating new posts? Simply create a new folder within the posts folder called new. There, add a new page.js, create a new component, and we can say new post. It is as simple as that. We now have a page that displays all posts, and this is going to be rendered at forward slash posts. And then we also have the new that's going to be rendered at forward slash posts, forward slash new, because it is nested within the posts folder. I hope this makes sense. And as you can see, everything is file based, meaning that you created the folders and your routing is ready. Now, our posts application kept growing. We kept adding new feature and we had the need for something known as dynamic routing. Dynamic routing is like having a flexible system for creating website pages based on different variables or data instead of manually creating each page. For example, instead of having just a regular website such as jsmastery.pro forward slash masterclass, which is always going to be the same, sometimes we're going to need to create dynamic pages that allow our website to generate these URLs on the fly, depending on what the user wants to visit. Expanding on the previous example of a blog application, let's say that we want to create a dynamic route to display the details of a blog post using the forward slash posts forward slash post ID pattern. This is something that you see incredibly often. You might want to have the posts and then blog post one and also blog post two, three, and so on. This is supposed to be dynamic. To achieve this in React, you would need to do this. We have the posts route, the new route as before, but now we have the colon post ID, meaning that this is going to render that dynamic route. In the context of Next.js, to achieve the same functionality, we would take a similar approach of creating a folder, but this time we would wrap it inside square brackets. That means that we're going to go into posts and within posts, we're going to create a new square brackets, and then we can call it post ID. This means that this is going to be a dynamic ID within the posts folder. And then inside of there, we can create a regular page.js, which we're used to. Now, if we create a functional component inside of this page, we're going to have access to that dynamic post ID variable, which means that we'll be able to dynamically render it and show special data. Once again, simpler than it was in React. Not that long ago, I explained how the layout.js file can be used to render footers or navigation bars in every single page that you have. But Next.js has one additional trick up its sleeve. We created these new posts routes and the post page. What you can do is you can create a new layout.js file inside of the subfolders as well, in this case, posts. The purpose of this file is to allow for the sharing of UI components between routes. For instance, let's say you want to create a new React functional component that's going to have the logic of navigate to top. You know how in most post pages, you want to have that button. Once you scroll down, you want to go back up. Well, let's say that you want to create a component which you want to reuse only on pages that are within the posts folder. Now you can do that. If you put the layout within the posts, it's going to be showing in the post ID in the new post, as well as in all the posts. On top of introducing the new layout for each of the subfolders, you can now also add a new loader or loading.js file for each one of these subfolders as well. 
The loading is going to look something like this, where you can render some kind of a loading skeleton, meaning an example of the page while it loads, or it can be a general spinner. But just so you know, while this page here is being loaded, this loader here is going to show. Sometimes our websites are not going to load correctly though, so in that case, we got to do some error handling. It is essential to handle the errors gracefully by catching them and then presenting meaningful error messages to the client side. In Next.js, handling errors is also pretty simple. Similar to the loading UI file, there is a new convention for creating errors. The only thing you have to do is create a new error.js. The only thing you have to do is create a new error.js file. This is going to automatically run when the error happens and it's going to gracefully present the error to the user. A typical error file might look something like this. You're going to have a use client component because error components must be client components to be able to recognize those errors. You're going to have a use effect maybe to cancel something out or an on click to reset and to bring the user back to where they were before the error. And with these couple of special file names, we explored most of the new Next.js 13 functionalities. You now understand the structure of a modern Next.js application. We discussed client and server-side components, routing, and all of these new special files that you can use to your advantage. There's just a couple more important concepts we need to go over before you build your own modern Next.js application. One of these important concepts is data fetching. Next.js provides three choices for selecting how to fetch data. Let's explore all of these one by one. First, we have server-side rendering, or SSR. By now, you should know what this means. It means dynamic server-rendered data. It is fetched fresh on each request. With SSR, each request to the server triggers a new rendering cycle and data fetch, ensuring that the content is always up to date. Here is a quick example. We have an async function page where we try to fetch some data from the JSON placeholder API. Specifically, it is a dynamic page because we get the ID through the params of the page. And then with this cache no store, it simply means, hey, don't store it, simply call it and then display the title and the body of the fetched post. This is going to ensure that it refetches it every single time, which means that it's server-side rendered. Now, to get to our second example, which is static site generation, the only thing we have to do is remove this cache no store. That means that by default, Next.js uses static site generation. That means that by default, Next.js uses static site generation. It will automatically fetch this data right here, but it will also cache it. This method is ideal for content that doesn't change frequently, such as blog posts, documentation, or marketing pages. First time, it's going to make a fetch, and then it's already going to have the data, and it's simply going to display it. The third method, called incremental static generation, or ISR for short, looks like this. Instead of messing with the cache, we can provide an additional parameter here called next revalidate 10. It combines the benefits of SSR and SSG for dynamic content in static sites. With incremental static generation, you can specify certain data to be statically fetched at build time while defining a revalidation time interval. This means that the data will be cached, but after a specific time frame, it's then going to refresh it and you're always going to have new data, making this the best of both worlds for dynamic content. Once again, we're going to dive deeper into all of these data fetching principles when developing our own Next.js application. But before being able to develop our application, which is going to be a full stack app, we of course need to learn how to utilize full stack capabilities within the Next.js application. And for that, we can focus on the serverless route handlers. As we discussed earlier, Next.js allows applications to be full stack, 
which means running the application both on the front end and on the back end. Using the same file-based routing system, Next.js allows us to handle HTTP requests and develop backend functionality without requiring an external server. First of all, let's see what do we have to do to make the simple get request route using a regular Express.js server. We of course have to import all of these dependencies such as Express, require them, and then create a new app.get route handler for forward slash API forward slash users. We can then fetch or create those users from a specific database and then return them. And this is an important part. We have to make our application listen on a specific port because this is a server that always has to be alive to be able to accept incoming requests. This example shows you how to create an Express.js application, define a route, a get route for users. And then when a get request is made to this route, it executes the code and returns the users. Next.js covers all of the features found in traditional backend servers, which includes middleware, parsing, authentication checks, and even serverless functions that simplify the deployment and scaling of API routes. Before we proceed to the same example route in Next.js, it's worth noting that there are two different ways to define a route handler. The first one is to create file-based route handlers right within the API folder within the app directory. And the second approach is to create a direct route handler within the app directory itself. But there's a caveat. With this approach, you have to create a special route.js file that's going to act as a backend API route. But if you want to create a route that's going to start with slash, like our page does, these two cannot interfere. In the same fashion, if you wanted to create an API route for forward slash posts, you wouldn't be able to have a route within the posts next to the page because Next.js won't know. Does this have to be a regular front-end page or a back-end API route? It's going to clash between forward slash posts that's going to render a regular page and forward slash posts that should be an API route. So in this case, you won't be able to do something like this, where we have the app users, and then you cannot have the page users with the route users, which is unfortunate. While this is an excellent feature that enables us to have both the routes and the pages really close to each other, I still recommend the first approach of creating the API routes, meaning don't create routes right within the app folder. Rather, to keep our code clean, and understandable, keep all the backend related logic and API endpoints within the API folder. This separation makes it clear that right here is the backend of your application and everything else in the app is the front end. So the process of creating a simple posts API route would look like this. We have a regular API folder inside of which we can create a users folder. And there we might want to do a route JS. This is now going to act as an API backend route. As the error layout loading in the page, route.js is also a special file name. And just for that reason, it allows us to create those backend routes. Out of the box, Next.js supports the following HTTP methods, get, post, put, patch, delete, head, and options. Essentially, everything that you need. To create an HTTP method inside of the route.js file, the process is incredibly straightforward. You simply need to write a get function and begin implementing your backend logic within it. Export async function get, and then you return the response as if you were returning it from the regular express server. In the same way and in the same file, you can also use all other HTTP verbs. Now let's return to that simple Express.js endpoint that I previously showed you. To create the endpoint with the same functionality in Next.js, the only thing you have to do is this. Export async function get, you get the users, and then you return them. Isn't that convenient? There is no need to set up any extra additional Express configuration. 
Just concentrate on what you need to get from specific endpoint. Think about the business logic and Next.js will handle all the other details. To witness this specific API in browser, what do you think? Where do we need to go? Keep in mind, it is within app, API, users, route. So that's going to look like this. HTTP colon forward slash forward slash localhost 3000 forward slash API forward slash users. And we have a route. That is it. As simple, straightforward, and intuitive as it can be. Congrats on coming this far of this Next.js crash course. There's just one more thing you need to learn before you're ready to create your own modern Next.js application in which you're going to utilize all of these concepts together. And that is how to improve the SEO of your Next.js applications. Recently, Next.js has also introduced their new metadata API and provided us with two new ways of managing metadata, static and dynamic. To modify the metadata in a static way, you'll have to do something like this. You're going to have a regular page. The only thing you have to do, this is really cool, is from the file in which you export that specific page or a route, you also now can export a special object called metadata. And the only thing you do is say export const metadata, and then you provide it a title. The output is going to be the head element that's going to contain the title of home. Now to bump that up a notch, we can also make use of dynamic metadata. That's going to look something like this. You're going to have an export async function called generate metadata. That's going to get the dynamic parameters of a specific page. For example, a product ID based on the product ID, we can then make a call to the get product function. And then as the title of the page, we can now return a dynamic title that is equal to the title of that specific product. The output is going to be your unique product name. This is going to, of course, improve SEO tremendously. And with that, we can conclude this Next.js crash course. But with JavaScript mastery, the end of the crash course is just the beginning of where the real learning starts. Now that you understand the Next.js structure, client and server components, routing, layout, loading, errors, data fetching, and API endpoints in Next.js, you are ready to implement all of them in the application that you will build in this video. So without any further ado, let's dive into the project. The project you'll build today is called Proomtopia. It is an open source AI prompting tool for modern world that helps you discover, create, and share creative prompts. As you're aware, we're using ChatGPT more and more every single day. So wouldn't it be great to have a list of all the phenomenal prompts that you can immediately pass on to ChatGPT? This is exactly what we're going to do. An app where you can discover and share AI powered prompts. First, we can log in using next auth and Google authentication. Once you're in, you can immediately start browsing all of the best prompts. The application allows you to search for tags, usernames, and prompt content too. So let's say you want to find something about web development. You can search web and there we go. You have all the web related prompts. Also, you can search for some tags like coding, and it's going to give you access to all of the prompts that have that tag in them. Finally, you can search for usernames. So if you know that a specific users shares their favorite prompts like JavaScript mastery, you can search for that and be able to immediately dive into their profile. From every single card, you can immediately copy it to clipboard. Or if you're the creator, you'll be able to edit a specific prompt as well as delete it. Essentially, Proomtopia is going to allow you to build a full stack Next.js 13 CRUD application. So without any further ado, let's dive right in. To get started with building your own Next 13 modern application, we're going to start as we always do on the JavaScript Mastery YouTube channel from bare beginnings. 
by creating a new empty folder on our desktop. Let's call it Prumtopia for prompts, of course, just the funny name there. Let's go ahead and drag and drop it into an empty Visual Studio Code window. Once you've done that, you can go ahead and zoom it in and go to View and then Terminal. Now we can run the same command we ran before for spinning up our Crash Course demo application. That's going to be mpx create-next-app at latest and then dot slash to create it in the current repository. You can press Y and then enter and then we can enter a couple of prompts. We won't be using TypeScript. We won't be using ESLint. We will be using Tailwind. We don't wanna create an SRC directory and we can just press enter for the default import alias. And there we go. It's installing the dependencies and we have our initial application structure just as we had it before. Now that our base dependencies have been installed, we can go ahead and install a couple of additional ones that we're gonna use to make this project come to life. We can do that by running npm install. And then the first one is bcrypt, which we're gonna use to hash passwords. Then we're gonna have MongoDB for our database and Mongoose, which is going to help manage it. And finally, we have next-auth. Finally, you can press enter and the dependencies will get installed. After they've been installed, you can go ahead and right-click the application folder. Yes, the most important folder in our app and completely delete it. We're gonna start from complete scratch. So go ahead and right-click in the root of the directory and then create a new app folder with nothing in it. Next to the app folder, we can immediately start by creating the rest of the file and folder structure of our application. So not inside it, rather in the root directory. Create a new folder called components. This is going to be for our reusable components. Then we can create a new one called models. This is going to be for our MongoDB Mongoose database models. You can delete the current public folder because I'm gonna provide you with a new one really soon. So let's recreate it by creating a new folder called public. For now, let's keep it empty. Below that, we're gonna have styles, again, an empty folder, and then finally, utils, for utility functions we'll be using throughout our application. Finally, one last file is going to be a .env file, our environment variables inside of which we can store secure keys. And that is it. Finally, before we start building out our project, I compiled a list of assets, icons, and style this project will use to make the development of the parts that really matter in this app easier. So to get started with getting those assets, you can click the GitHub gist link down below and you can copy the tailwind.config.js file. It looks like this and you can simply override the existing one. That's going to give you access to some font families and colors. After that, in that same GitHub gist file below, you can find the new globals.css file. So copy the contents of the globals.css, create a new file within the styles, and simply paste it here. You'll see that we just have some useful styling utility functions and some setup of the main div, as well as the imports for the tailwind and for the fonts. Finally, Below the GitHub gist link, there's going to be a link to a downloadable zipped folder that's going to contain all of our assets. So simply download it, unzip it, and then paste it within the public folder. It should look something like this, public, assets, icons, and then images. Great, that is it. It means that we are ready to dive into the app directory and figure out how to start developing our application. Of course, what a better way to start than simply creating a new file within the app called page.jsx. It is that new unique file that's going to render our homepage. We can run refce inside of there to create a React arrow function. And if this didn't work for you, there's this cool extension called ES7 plus React React Native Redux Snippets. So just download it and it's going to allow you to immediately spin up React components. Great. 
With that said, in Next.js, we no longer need to specify the React import, so we can delete that. And we can rename this to Home. Great. And before we go ahead and spin up our application, we need that second really important file that we mentioned during our crash course. That's going to be the layout.jsx file. Inside of there, we can also run RAFCE to create a React function. We don't need to import React, but what we can import is add styles forward slash globals.css. As you can see, we don't have to mention the entire path. We just have to say add styles and then reference the styles within. This is going to import the CSS to our entire application. Also, we can immediately change the metadata of our application by saying export const metadata is equal to an object with a title equal to Prumtopia and a description equal to discover and share AI prompts. Great. Finally, we can wrap everything in an HTML tag to which we can provide a length tag. It's going to be in English. We can provide a body tag. And within that body, we can have two different tags. The first one is going to be a div with a class name equal to main. And within it, we're going to have a self-closing div that's going to have a class name equal to gradient. This is just going to change the background. Finally, we're going to have the actual main part of our application that's going to have the class name equal to app. And then within it, we want to render all the children. As we said, the layout is going to be wrapped around everything. And sticking with the rules of naming React components, we can rename this with a capital starting letter, something like root layout. And of course, don't forget to export it. Wonderful. Now that we have our layout and our page.jsx, which is the actual home of our Pruntopi application, we can now open up the terminal by going to view and then terminal. And we can run npm run dev. This is going to start the server on localhost 3000. So simply control click it and it'll open showing you that it cannot resolve the at styles forward slash globals.css. No worries, we can easily fix that by going to jsconfig.json and then removing this forward slash here. This means simply take it from the root route and take everything. So once you fix that, we can go back to the layout. And I also noticed that we're never importing children from anywhere. So we're getting them through props. So we can simply say children here. And if we make that change to the JS config, so it looks like this. And if we get the children from props right here, you can see that we have this home right here and this great looking background. Wonderful. That means that we are ready to start developing the project. So to make it easier to develop, let's simply drag and drop our browser to the right side and keep our code to the left side. There we go. We are ready to continue implementing the home page. To get started with our home component, we can first wrap everything in an HTML5 semantic section tag. That section is going to have a class name equal to w full for full width, flex center, as well as flex dash call, so the elements fall one below another. Inside of here, we're using something known as Tailwind. Tailwind allows you to quickly add styles simply by writing utility classes. For most parts, it's going to be easy to understand what a specific class is supposed to do. But if you're unsure of what a specific class means, simply go to tailwindcss.com and search for it. Type w full in this case, and you can immediately see that that's going to change the width. There we go. If you'd like me to create a full crash course on Tailwind, comment down below and let me know. Great. With that said, we can proceed with creating an H1, a main heading within our section. In there, we can say something like discover and share. If we save it, 
we can see it right here. But let's also give it a class name equal to head underscore text and text dash center. This is already going to make it look so much better. And whenever you see underscores, that means that this is coming from our own styling within globals.css. So if we search for head underscore text, you can see all the styles that are going to be applied right here. Great. Below our discover and share, still inside of the H1, we can create a break tag. And that break tag is going to have a class name equal to max md hidden. We're going to hide it on large devices, but we want to break the content on smaller devices. So below, we want to create a span that's going to say AI powered prompts. There we go. Discover and share AI powered prompts. Of course, I misspelled it here. And then we can give it a class name equal to orange underscore gradient and text dash center. This is looking so much better. Below that H1 tag, we can also add a P tag. And there we can say something like Pruntopia is an open source AI prompting tool for modern world to discover, create, and share creative prompts. Great. Of course, we can also give it a class name. That's going to say DESC description, as well as text dash center. There we go, looking much better. Now, immediately below this P tag, later on, we're going to have our feed component. For now, we haven't yet created it. So I'm simply going to leave a comment right here. And we can move on to build the navigation bar of our website. So first, we want to go to components and create that navbar component. As a matter of fact, while we're creating that component, let's create the file structure for all of the components we'll be using throughout this project. So we're going to have something known as a feed JSX, where we're going to show all the prompts. And inside of there, we can run RAFCE. Let's create another one called form JSX. And again, we can run RAFCE. The third component on our list is going to be our nav.jsx, inside of which we can also create a base functional component. The next component is going to be the profile.jsx, inside of which we can create a new empty function. Finally, we're going to have something known as a prompt card.jsx. And the last one on our list is going to be known as a provider.jsx and we can run RAFCE. Great. Now we have provided a way for us to use all of these components from within our code. So while we're here, let's immediately utilize the feed component inside of our homepage. And we can do that by importing it at the top. So we can simply say import feed from add components forward slash feed. Next.js makes it so easy to know the path. And finally, we can call a self-closing feed component right here, which is going to just render the word feed. That's okay for now. As we said, now we can move on to the layout JSX inside of which we'll be calling our navigation bar. The reason why we're calling the navigation bar from within here is because we want to reuse it across all our pages, which is exactly what the layout JSX is for. So inside of here, Let's import nav from add components forward slash nav. And we're going to also import something known as a provider coming from add components forward slash provider, which we're going to use later on. For now, the only thing we have to do is we have to go above children and then create a self closing nav component. It should appear right here which means that we are ready to control click it, go into it and start implementing our navigation bar. Within our navigation bar, we can import something known as a link coming from next forward slash link. This is going to allow us to move to the other pages of our application. We can also import the image tag coming from next forward slash image, which is going to automatically optimize the images for us. 
Later on in this file, we'll be also using some hooks from React. So let's go ahead and import them right away by saying import use state as well as use effect coming from, of course, React. Even though we're writing Next.js, we're still interacting with all of the React functional components and hooks. Finally, we're going to import a couple of things coming from next-auth forward slash react. We want to import sign in, sign out, use session, and get providers. These great utility functions are going to make the sign in and the sign up flow incredibly simple. Finally, we are ready to start creating the JSX or the structure of our navigation bar. We can get started by turning this div into a semantic nav tag and giving it a class name equal to flex dash between w dash full margin bottom of 16 or MB 16 for short and PT three for padding top. Inside of there, we can create our first link. That link is going to have an href just to forward slash, meaning the root route. And we can give it a class name equal to flex gap dash two and flex dash center. Within it, we can show the logo of our application. We're going to use the built-in Next.js image tag. We can make it self-closed and give it a source equal to forward slash assets, forward slash images, forward slash logo dot SVG. If we save it, you can see fail to compile and immediately we get into that discussion that we had at the start of our crash course. You are importing a component that needs use effect. It only works in a client component, but none of its parents are marked with use client. So they are server components by default. Maybe you should try marking one of these components as use client. And that is exactly what we need to do. So at the top, as we discussed earlier, whenever you're using some client based functionalities, such as hooks, in this case, you need to add a directive called use client and save it. Immediately, that's going to fix our issue. But now we have another one saying that the image with source also needs a width property. So let's continue styling our image by giving it an alt tag equal to Primtopia logo, a width equal to 30 pixels, height equal to 30 pixels, and a class name equal to object dash contain. If we save this, you can see our great logo appear on top. And again, I wanted us to get this error saying that we need to use client to show you that it's really that simple. Whenever you use some client side functionality, Next.js is going to let you know, hey, please mark this component as use client. And that's exactly what we did here. In the future, when developing more Next.js applications, you will immediately know to add this at the top because you'll be using some states later down the line. Great. Now we can continue by below our image, adding a P tag that's going to have a class name equal to logo underscore text. And it's going to say Prumtopia. Now, if we expand our browser just a bit, you can see it appear here, but on smaller devices, we don't see it. Wonderful. Now below this link, we can start by creating the mobile navigation. Since it's a mobile navigation, the div that's going to wrap it is going to have a class name that's going to say on small devices, it's going to be flex, meaning visible, but usually it's going to be hidden. Now within here, we need to know whether a user is currently logged in or not to know which buttons do we have to show. So for now, just to mock the state of a user being logged in or not, we can create a new variable const is user logged in. And for now, we're going to set that to true. Now we can use this variable right here is user logged in a ternary operator. If they are, we can display a div. And if they're not, we can just return an empty React fragment for now. Great. So now since we are logged in, at least right now, well, we don't have any users. What we can do is give a class name to this div, 
such as Flex, Gap-3, and on medium devices, Gap-5. And since we are logged in, we have a link button to create a new post. So we can say create post. href is going to be equal to create-prompt and class name is going to be black underscore btn. If we save that, you should be able to see a button appear on the top, right? But you'll only be able to see it on desktop devices. There we go. So inside of here, when I said that this is a mobile navigation, this is a desktop navigation first, and then later on, we're going to focus on the mobile navigation. So why is it on small devices flex? Well, because the small devices actually start from this endpoint right here. So if we are extra small, it's going to be hidden, but for everything larger than small, we're going to be able to see create post. Great. Now below this link, we can create a button. That button is going to be of a type is equal to button. It's going to have an on click, which is going to render the sign out function. It's going to have a class name equal to outline underscore BTN. And it's going to simply say sign out. There we go. So we can create a post or sign out. And then below that button, we can create another link that's going to have an href equal to forward slash profile. And it can render an image. That image later on is going to render a source of a real user image. For now, we can simply render images profile.svg. Let's give it a width equal to, I found 37 pixels to work the best, height of 37 pixels, class name equal to rounded-full, and I'll tag off profile. And it looks like we don't have this profile icon right here. Let's see if there is something else we can use. Maybe let's use just our logo right now for the placeholder before we get our real user images. So that's going to be images, logo.svg. There we go. Later on, this is going to be a real user photo from Google. Now, what happens if we are not logged in? Well, for now, if we switch it, nothing's gonna happen. Inside of here, we're gonna have a button to sign in. And to be able to do that using next auth, we have to have access to something known as providers. So right here at the top, we are importing get providers, but we're not yet initializing them. So what we can do is say const providers set providers is equal to use state. And at the start, it's going to be set to null. So it's going to look like this. Now, how do we set those providers using Next.js is we create a new use effect hook that has a callback function and only runs at the start. Then we create a function called const set providers, which is equal to an async function. And there we say const response is equal to await get providers. So we're calling it from here, next auth react. Once we get the response, we can simply set providers to our state equal to response. Of course, our set providers function is not getting called anywhere. So we simply have to call the set providers here. That's going to allow us to sign in using Google and next auth. So how do we do it? Well, here we have to open up a new dynamic block of code and check if we have access to providers. So providers and end. If we do have access to providers, then we can do the following object dot values to which we pass the providers, and then we map over it. We get each individual provider as a result of the map, and we return a button for each provider. So right here, a button. I know this is a bit confusing, but essentially this is allowing us to have all the different providers and show the buttons for the sign up right here. Of course, in our case, we'll be using only one provider that's going to be Google Auth. So we can give this button a type equal to button, a key equal to provider.name, and an on click property equal to a callback function where we call the sign in 
and pass in the provider.id. And of course, we can give it a class name equal to black underscore btn and make it say sign in. If we now save this, we cannot see it because even though we're trying to fetch the providers, they're not actually there. We're going to do this later on once we fully set up the next auth. But for now, we can just turn this back to the is user logged in is equal to true. There we go. Now, of course, if we go to the mobile view, you're going to be able to notice that this disappears which means that we can scroll all the way down below our desktop navigation and we can create mobile navigation. Doing that is going to be similar to doing the desktop one. We can start by creating a div, giving it a class name, saying on small devices it's going to be hidden. Usually it's going to be flex and it's going to be relative. Here we can again check is user logged in. If they are, we can render a div that's going to have a class name equal to flex. And then we can render the profile icon. For now, we can copy the previous profile image that we had, this time without the link. So that's going to be image that's going to have the source equal to assets, images, logo.svg, at least for now. Later on, we're going to also give it an on click property to make it open up the drop down for the mobile navigation bar. And we of course also have to settle with the second part of the ternary operator. So what's going to happen if we're not logged in? In that case, we can render absolutely the same thing we rendered here. That's going to be a react fragment with the providers and the sign in button. So simply paste it right here. Now we still have two additional errors. First, it's complaining that our on click is empty. So we can provide it with an empty callback function. And then we have an extra pair of parentheses right here. So if we fix all of that, we are good to go. But now we have to make this button open up a menu. To be able to do that, we need a new use state. We can create that state by saying use state snippet. Let's call it toggle dropdown set toggle drop down and at the start it's going to be set to false we can scroll all the way down and on click we want to set the toggle drop down to the opposite of its current value when you're changing state in react it is not recommended to simply say set toggle drop down and then the opposite of the current state it's never a good idea to change react state using the previous version of that same state as that can lead to unexpected behavior. So what we do instead is open up a new callback function within that state where we get the previous state called prev and then we update it by saying not prev. There we go. So now that's going to set the variable to true. Based on that variable right below this image, we can open a new dynamic block where we can say if toggle dropdown is true, meaning toggle drop down and end. In that case, we can render a div that's going to have a class name equal to drop down. Inside of there, we can render a link that's going to have an href equal to forward slash profile, class name equal to drop down underscore link, and an on click property that's going to then reset the drop down to false. So set toggle drop down is false. And there we can simply say my profile. Now, if we save that and click on this icon, you can see my profile here. Now let's add a couple more links. We're going to add a link to create a new prompt so we can duplicate this link below, point it to create dash prompt, and we're going to leave the on click to false so it resets the navigation that can say create prompt. And finally, we're going to have one additional thing, which is going to be a button. This button is going to be of a type is equal to button. It's going to have an on click property equal to a 
callback function where we set the toggle dropdown to false once again, and we also want to sign out. There we go. And the button is going to, of course, say sign out. We can also give it some class names such as margin top five to divide it from the content, w dash full and black underscore btn. If we now save this and go back to previous page, we can click this menu and you can see my profile, create prompt and sign out. That is great. As a matter of fact, that is it when it comes to our navigation bar. The mobile nav bar looks and behaves great. And also on our desktop, this looks great. Of course, it doesn't make sense to have the logo on two sides. So the next meaningful step in improving our application could be to make the authentication work so we can truly authenticate users in using Google Next Auth. And then we'll be able to show their profile photo. So let me collapse this right here, close all of the currently open files, and navigate to one of the components we have created called provider. Inside of here, we're going to import something known as a session provider coming from next dash auth forward slash react. Then we want to be able to get the children and the current session through props. And this is going to be a higher order component, meaning we're going to wrap other components with it, which means that as a return statement, we have to use that session provider, but then within it, we have to render the children. And finally, the session is going to be set to session. In this case, we are using the browser's capabilities. So we do have to use the client directive on top. There we go. Now, in the crash course, we mentioned where all the providers go, the Redux toolkit query, the usually used files and functionalities, they all go within the layout component, because that way, they'll be used everywhere across the app. So we can go to the layout, we already imported the provider, and we can simply wrap everything within our body with the provider component. And we can end it right here below our main. There we go. This is great. We're one step closer to implementing authentication. But next auth doesn't just use the front end files within the app for authentication, it uses the Next.js API backend endpoints as well. So immediately, this is going to be an amazing opportunity to dive into the API folder within the app. So let's create a new folder called API. And within it, we can create a new folder called auth. Within the add folder, we can create a new folder that's within the square brackets dot 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 next auth. This is the currently accepted best practice. And within there, we can create a new route.js file. So it's an API route within API auth dynamic next auth, and then we have the route. Within here, we can set up our providers such as Google authentication. As I said, a wonderful opportunity to dive headfirst into the use of Next.js API routes or backend endpoints alongside using the frontend side as well. Next.js allows you to do both. So bear with me, we're going to have this set up in no time. To get started with authentication, we can import next auth coming from next dash auth. Alongside the next auth, we'll also need to import the Google provider coming from next dash auth forward slash providers forward slash Google. There we go. Now to handle our authentication, we can create a handler. Const handler is equal to next auth, which we call as a function and then provide the options object. Within the options object, we first need to have a providers array inside of which we can specify our Google provider, which we call as a function and provide an additional options object. In here, we need to have a client ID, which is going to be equal to an empty string for now, as well as a client secret, 
which we can also leave as an empty string. Finally, we'll have to have some functions. So next to this array, or below it, we're going to have an async session function, which is going to get the session as its first and only parameter. And right below it, we're going to also have the async sign in function, which is going to get the profile right here within the parameters. Finally, at the end, we can export handler as get, as well as handler as post. This is not something we'll usually do. Usually we're going to do everything as either a get or a post. But for next authentication, this is how we have to do it and how it's explained in the official documentation. Now let's go to the Google's console and let's get our credentials. First, go to console.cloud.google.com. I'm going to make this much bigger so we can see it better. From here, we need to create a new project. So click on the project name or new project on top left and create a new project. Let's call it Proomptopia. There we go. And we can click Create. As you can see, it is being created as we speak. So let's give it a second and it's going to be done. There we go. Let's go ahead and select it. It's going to be shown on top left. Open up the navigation menu, go to APIs and services, and then OAuth consent screen. Click Create. Enter the app name, in this case, Proomtopia, and your email. Finally, we can add the authorized domain. That's going to be localhost 3000. And let's start it with HTTP. If you want to, you can enter your logo. We can scroll down and you can again enter your developer email. I'm going to do JavaScript mastery and click save and continue. Finally, let's go to credentials, create credentials, OAuth client ID, choose the application type as web, add the authorized JavaScript origin of localhost 3000 or HTTP colon forward slash forward slash localhost 3000 and then add the authorized redirect URI as well we can do the same localhost 3001 and click create. This process can take about five minutes, but we can immediately see our client ID and client secret right here. So let's go ahead and copy them and go to that .env file we created before. First, you can paste the Google underscore ID is equal to, and then the Google client secret is equal to, to the secret that we have right here. I just closed it, but hopefully we can get back to it. There we go. Copy it and paste it here. Of course, don't use my credentials. Create your own within the console.cloud.google.com. Great. With that said, we should be able to reload our application just to be sure that the environmental variables got updated. And then we can utilize those client ID and client secret variables right within our handler. We can do that by saying process.env.google underscore ID, as well as process.env.google client secret. Great. Just to be sure these variables are being passed properly, we can console log an object containing the same exact thing to see if we indeed are getting them. So now if we go back, collapse this, open up the console and reload the page, you can see that we don't get anything, but inside of here, we do keep getting them and we get them every couple of seconds, which is not good. So for now, I'm going to stop our client from running and our terminal. And then we can make sure that we only call this when it is necessary. But a good thing to know is that the client ID and the client secret are there. We at least know that we're getting our client ID and the client secret, which means that we can proceed with the development of our next auth route. So let's focus on creating the session and sign in functions. First, to be able to get the user session, 
we of course have to sign the user in. So what we can do is we can create a new try and catch block. Now keep in mind, every Next.js route is something known as a serverless route, which means that this is a Lambda function that opens up only when it gets cold. So every time it gets cold, it needs to spin up the server and make a connection to the database. That is great because we don't have to keep our server running constantly, but we do have to actually make a connection to the database. So for that reason, we're going to go to our utils and within there, create a new file called database.js, which we're going to use to connect or hook it up to our database. From within here, we can import mongoose coming from mongoose. We can also create a variable let is connected is equal to false at the start. This will allow us to track the connection status. Finally, we can export const connect to db, which is going to be an asynchronous function. And inside of here, we can create a connection to the database, of course. First, let's set up the mongoose.set strict query. This simply sets the mongoose options. If we don't do this, we're going to get warnings in the console. So I always recommend setting strict query to true. After that, we can check if we are currently connected. So if is connected, in that case, we can console log mongo db is already connected and we can return out of this function to stop it from running. If we are not already connected, we can open up a new try and catch block and we can try to establish the connection by saying await mongoose.connect and then in here we have to enter the URI of our mongodb atlas instance or the URI of our actual database. That's going to be stored inside of the process.env.mongodb underscore URI. And then we have to provide the options object. Within the options object, we have to enter the DB name, which is going to be something like share prompt. And we can pass additional options such as use new URL parser set to true and use unified topology set to true. And if this executes correctly, we can set the is connected variable to true and we can say console log mongodb connected. Finally, if we have an error, we can simply console.log that specific error. Now, of course, we don't yet have the MongoDB URI or the database we want to connect to, to be able to save those users. So what we can do is head to the MongoDB Atlas, which is an online cloud storage to create your database. So let's do that right away. You can head to mongodb.com forward slash Atlas and click try free, sign up with Google or simply sign in. Once you're in, you should be able to see something that looks like this. If you don't already have a cluster created, you can go ahead and click create, move from dedicated to shared, and then click create cluster. It's completely free. Once you create your cluster, go to database access and ensure that you know the password to your account. If you don't know it, simply edit the password right here. Once you know the password to your account, also go to network access, click add IP address, and you can add your current IP address. But there should also be a button to add 0000, which is going to include all IP addresses, which means that this is going to be accessible from anywhere in the world, which is what you want to do. Great. Now that you know your password, we can go back to database, click connect, and then click drivers. There, you can copy your MongoDB URI. Once you have it, go back to your application, go to your .env and create a variable called MongoDB underscore URI and make it equal to, to this query. 
Of course, ensure to change the password to the password that you have under your specific user. Once you've done that, you can go back and we are done with the connection to the MongoDB database, which means that we can go back to route and we can make use of that function we just created. We can do that by scrolling to the top and importing connect to DB within the curly braces from add utils forward slash database. And now right here in the sign in, the only thing we have to do is say await connect to DB and call it as a function. Now there are two things we'll have to do here or two checks we'll have to make. The first one is check if a user already exists. And the second check is if not, create a new user and save it to the database. Finally, once we successfully sign in, we can return true. Or if we don't sign in successfully, we can simply console log the error and then we can return false. Since we don't already have any users, we'll have to create a function to create one and add it to the database that we just connected to. Great. So to be able to do that, we first need to create something known as a model based on which the document of the user will be created. So that's going to happen in the models directory, inside of which we can create a new file called user.js. Inside of here, we can import a schema, a model, as well as models, plural. And that's going to come from Mongoose, which is helping us interact with the MongoDB database. So let's go ahead and create the schema by saying const user schema is equal to new schema. We're going to call it as a function and pass in the options object. There, we want to make sure that the user has an email. So email is going to be of a type is equal to string. Unique is going to be set to an array where the first element is true and then the actual message if it fails. So if it's not unique, we're going to say email already exists. Same thing for required. It has to be required. And if this fails, we're going to say email is required. Now we can repeat the procedure for the username. It's going to be of a type string. It's going to be required as well. So required, true, and then username is required. And finally, we're going to add a match, meaning it has to match a specific regular expression. So down in the description below in the GitHub gist, you'll be able to find the piece of code for the match. This is a regular expression that says that the username is invalid. It should contain eight to 20 alphanumeric letters and be unique. Finally, below the username, we're going to have the image that's going to be of a type is equal to string. And that is it. That is our user. Now, usually if we were working with a regular express backend, we would say something like const user is equal to model user and we pass in the user schema and finally export default user. We would do this if we were working with a regular, always on, always running backend server. But in Next.js, it's a bit different. We said that the route is only going to be created and running for the time when it is getting cold. So there is one check we have to make. The models object is provided by the Mongoose library and stores all the registered models. We're referring to this thing right here. So it stores all the models that have been previously registered. If a model named user already exists in the models object, it assigns that existing model to the user variable. This is going to prevent us from redefining the model and ensure that the existing model is reused. So essentially, alongside just creating a new model, we can say, first, look into the models.user, see if it's there, and only if it's not there, then create a new model. That's because this route gets called every time and the connection is established every single time from scratch. So we have to make this additional check. Great. 
now we have the model for our user. So we can go back to the route and we can import it at the top by saying import user with a capital U from add models forward slash user. Finally, going down, we can check if a user already exists by saying const user exists is equal to await user dot find one and we'll try to find it by email. So we can say email is equal to profile dot email. Finally, if a user does not exist, we can check if not user exists. In that case, we want to await user dot create and we want to create a user by passing in the email, which is equal to profile dot email, the username, which is equal to profile dot name dot replace a space with no space. So essentially we want to make sure that it has no spaces. And we also want to ensure that it is lowercase. So we can say to lower case. And finally, we're going to pass the image equal to profile dot picture. And this is going to allow us to create a new user if one does not already exist. Great. So now we have the sign in function, which automatically also creates a new user in the database. Finally, we want to be able to get the data about that user every single time to keep an existing and running session. So what we can do is say const session user is equal to await user dot find one, where email is equal to session dot user dot email. So we're getting the current one from the session. And we want to update its ID by saying session dot user dot ID is equal to session user dot underscore ID dot to string, which we call as a function and then return that session. So we are updating it, making sure that we always know which user is currently online. And with that, we're done with the route that's going to handle our entire authentication process. If you're still unsure of why we did specific things in the way that we did them, such as creating this handler, next auth, importing these things, or even exporting them in the way that we did, definitely ensure to check out the next auth documentation. Just go to next-auth.js.org, go to getting started, and in here you can see the entire procedure for everything we did, from installing next auth, adding the API route, and then all the other functions and things that we did as well. Inside of here, if you go a bit deeper, you can see how to create the Next.js odd callbacks, such as the session one we created right now. But you can also see that we need to configure specific callback URLs. And later on, we'll need a specific variable for deploying to production. The documentation says that we need a couple of different environment variables for this to work. So go back to the .env and create three new variables. Next auth underscore URL, which you can set to HTTP colon forward slash forward slash localhost 3000. Next auth underscore URL underscore internal, which you can also set to localhost 3000. And then the next auth secret. Later on in production, we'll be able to simply change those and make the authentication work with a deployed link. The last thing is the next auth underscore secret so what is this random string? Well, if we go to the options part where they talk about secret, they said that this is a random string used to hash tokens. So how to create it? Simply go to your terminal and type open SSL in there with a rand base 64 32. If you're on Windows, you most likely won't have this already installed. So you can simply copy the command and then go to the following website. I found the OpenSSL terminal where you can simply paste this value, press enter, and it's going to give you a string, which you can then copy and paste in your environment variables. Great. With that said, we are ready to test out how our authentication works. Now to test it out, let's open up the terminal, clear it and run npm run dev now that we have all the newest environment variables and the new code. It's going to run it on localhost 3000. As soon as we run it, we get an error saying the top level await experiment is not enabled. 
set experiments.toplevelAwait to true to enable it. So to be able to do that, go to files, next.config, and down in the description in the GitHub gist that you visited before, you can find the code for the entire next.config.js, so simply override it. There, you'll be able to find some experimental features, several components, external packages for Mongoose, and the top level await, which we need to make this work. Finally, before trying to run it one more time, let's go back to models, user.js, and then inside of here, I noticed that instead of new schema, we should have run new and then schema like this. So this is just one typo that I noticed that we can fix and we are now ready to run our application. So let's go ahead and run npm run dev for hopefully one final time to see what are we gonna have. Server is running on localhost 3000 and it compiled successfully. Great, open up the menu. And for now, we're just mocking the state of not being signed in. So let's go to our nav. And here at the top, we can now pull the real data from the session instead of simply saying, is user locked in? We can use this next auth hook, use session to be able to get the current user data. So let's do just that. The only thing we have to do is say const inside of curly braces data, and we can rename it to session is equal to use session. Based on this information, whenever we use some fake data, such as here is user logged in, we can now say session question mark dot user. So we're checking if a user exists. And we also have this down below, or rather above on our desktop navigation bar, right here, session question mark dot user. Immediately, the app should figure out that we are not currently locked in and it should allow us to do so. I can see that we are missing a mobile navigation bar, which is not good. If I expand it, we're missing the entire thing altogether. So let's figure out why is it not showing. First, let's go ahead and just alert session question mark dot user to be able to know what do we have in there. So just alert so we don't have to open up the console and it says undefined, which is as it should be because right now we don't have the user. So we know that this is going to be false. So we won't be able to create a post or sign out, but we should be able to go here and sign in. So let's also go ahead and alert the provider subject because if we have it, then we should be able to sign in. So right here, I'm gonna alert the provider's object. And we can see it is null, which is not good. So let's figure out why are we not getting our providers. The providers themselves are coming from here, get providers, and we have set providers where we set the response. But it looks like it's not being used. And that's because I called this function in the same way I called our use set state. So we definitely have to change that. I'm gonna rename this function to something like set up providers. And then here we can just use the regular set providers. Sorry for the confusion there. As you can see, naming these functions is incredibly important. That now gives us access to our providers, which means that we get our sign in button on the top. So let's go ahead and click it. And we can see access blocked. This app's request is invalid. And that's not a problem because we can see a meaningful error right here. It says error 400 redirect URI mismatch. And if we dive deeper into the next odd documentation, we can see that there is a get post API auth callback and then provider state. This is something we have to add to the callback of the Google Cloud Console. So let's go ahead and copy this specific URL. Go back to the API console. Go to web client under OAuth to client IDs. And then if you scroll down, you can see authorized redirect URIs. Simply click add URI, add HTTP 
colon forward slash forward slash localhost 3000 API auth callback and then not provider, but rather it's going to be Google. And you can click save. Again, whenever you're using a framework, the difference between a framework and a library is that the framework makes things a lot easier for you, but you have to follow its rules. So it's important to know what you're doing by reading the documentation of these great tools that are at our disposal. Now, if we go back and try to sign in one more time, now it works. And you can see all your Google accounts appear. Choose an account to continue to Primtopia. I'm going to choose JavaScript Mastery. And just like that, I think we're logged in because we have my profile and create prompt. But now that we're finally logged in, let's get rid of this logo and show a real profile icon. We can do that if we go to our navigation bar and here under images, right now we have assets, images, logo, but we can replace that with a real icon. So that's going to be coming from the session, question mark dot user dot image. If we save that, you can see JavaScript mastery, or in this case, your own Google icon, which means that we are successfully logged in. And if I'm not mistaken, we also have to change this on desktop. So let's try to find it. There we go. Link to the profile. That's going to be session question mark dot user dot image. If we save that, our mobile is looking great. And if we expand it, we can see it on the desktop too. That means that we have successfully set up the next API authentication route that allows us to create an account using Google. So we have successfully combined the front end part of Next.js, the back end part as well, and hopefully we hooked it up to the database as well. Of course, we're yet to check that part. So let's go to our database, visit our cluster, and then go to collections. We named our database share prompt, but in here, I just have my old application called booking. That means that neither our database nor the user that was supposed to be in it were created. So let's go back to our application and figure out why that is the case. I didn't even see any console messages right here, whether we are connected or not. It is almost as if the connect to DB function was not getting called at all. And if it were not getting called, then that means that this block of code was not executed. And it looks like I made a tiny mistake. When working with next odd handler, you have providers, and then you have something known as callbacks. This right here was supposed to be an object containing the callbacks, and then the async function session and sign in were supposed to go within it. So I'm going to copy them and put them right within the callbacks like this. We have providers, comma, callbacks, and then we have a callback called sign in. So now it should actually get executed. So let's go ahead and test it out by signing out one more time, signing in once again. There we go. We are locked in. We got MongoDB connected, which is great. And if we go to our MongoDB cloud, and if we try to refresh the data, we can see that we have a new share prompt database with the user's collection and with one document inside of it, which is the username JavaScript mastery containing the image, exactly what we have right here. Now, what was the reason for us creating the actual database if we were able to log in even without it to save prompts and attach them to specific accounts? That way, we'll be able to check out different accounts and different profile pages of different users. So that finally allows us to dive into the create post functionalities, therefore showing the prompts on our feed. Great work on coming to this part of the video. We've already laid a phenomenal foundation for us to be able to go into the app and creating our second page, which is the create post. So we can right click the app create a new folder called create dash prompt. And inside of it, you already know what we need to do is create a new page.jsx, 
inside of which we can create a React arrow function component. Here, we can simply call it create prompt. And for now, it can say create prompt. Now, if we go ahead and click create post, that's going to navigate to create prompt and immediately that's it. Our route is ready just by us creating this specific file. Also keep in mind that our entire layout was inherited. That means that our navigation bar is immediately showing right here. How easy it is using next 13. So creating a prompt page is going to be our next step. To get started with creating our create prompt page, we're going to import a hook called use state coming from react. And as soon as we import a hook, we immediately know that we have to turn this into a use client directive page. Great. Alongside the use state hook, we're going to also import the use session hook coming from next dash auth forward slash react. This is going to allow us to know which user is currently locked in. And finally, we can import the use router hook coming from next forward slash navigation. Inside of the create prompt, we're going to also import one component called form coming from add components forward slash form. So immediately we can start by returning just one element from this create prompt page. And that's going to be a reusable self-closing form component. To our form, we're going to pass a couple of things. First, we need to know about the state. Are we currently submitting the form? So we can say use state hook. And we can say submitting and set submitting at the start set to false. And we can also create a new use state. This time it's going to be called post set post. And at the start, it's going to be set to an empty object containing a prompt set to an empty string, as well as a tag set to an empty string as well. Finally, we're going to create a function called const create prompt, which is equal to an async arrow function that accepts the event. And for now we can leave it empty. Now we have access to all of the variables, which we can pass to our form. The first one is going to be the type of our form, and that is going to be create in this case. Then we can pass the actual post equal to post. We're going to pass the set post equal to set post, the submitting state equal to submitting. And then finally the handle submit state equal to create prompt. This now allows us to copy all of these fields. I'm doing this by holding the alt key and double clicking the words, and then I can simply copy them and control click into the form and accept all of these as props. So we can nicely structure them right here in one line. There we go. And we can see them here. So our form is accepting a type, a post set post submitting and handle submit. So we can immediately start working on it. If we go here to our website, we can see that we have only one element, which is right now a div containing the word form. Inside of our form, we're going to just need to import something known as a link coming from next forward slash link. Our form is going to be a section. That section is going to have a class name equal to w dash full for full width, max dash w dash full flex dash start, as well as flex dash call for column. Inside of there, we're going to have an H1. That H1 is going to render the type, and then it's going to say post. So the type in this case is create because we're passing that through props. So it's going to say create post. We can also give it a class name equal to head underscore text, as well as text dash left. Great. Now this type post, it's wrapped in an H1, but we can also wrap it within the span element. So right here, we can say span, close the current text, and we can give it a class name equal to blue underscore gradient. 
and this is looking just a bit more custom. Below the H1, we're gonna have a P tag, and we can give it a class name equal to DESC for description, text dash left, and max dash W dash MD for maximum content width. Inside of there, we can say type and share. That's going to be create and share. Amazing prompts with the world. And let your imagination run wild with any AI powered platform. Great. Finally, we can go below our P tag and create our actual form. The form is going to have an on submit property that's going to be equal to the handle submit, which we're passing through the props. And it's going to have a class name. In this case, it's going to be MT-10 for margin top 10 to divide it a bit from the content, W-full, max-W-2XL, flex, flex dash column, so the elements appear one above another, gap dash seven for the spacing in between, and finally, glass morphism. This is a special class that's going to give us this glassy look. Within the form, we wanna have a label component. That label is going to contain a span element, and that span is going to say your AI prompt. There we go. Of course, it's not yet styled, so let's go ahead and give it a style, or rather give it a class name, equal to font-satoshi, font-semi-bold, text-base, and text-gray-700. This is going to make it look just a bit better. Finally, let's add a text area for this label. So that's going to be text area. It's going to be a self-closing component that's going to contain a value equal to post.prompt. It's going to contain an on change equal to a callback function where we get the event. And we want to update the post by saying set post is equal to an object where we first spread the entire post value and then set the prompt to be equal to e.target.value because this is gonna update the prompt of the post. We also have to update the hashtag later on. Let's also give it a placeholder equal to write your prompt here. Let's make it required. And let's give it a class name equal to form underscore text area. If we save this, we'll be able to have our post. Finally, we can duplicate this entire label below and then the second label is going to be for the field of the prompt. We can say prompt field, or we can simply say tag. So a tag that explains where this prompt could be used. We can also create a span within a span that's going to kind of explain what it is. So we can say something like hashtag product, hashtag web development, or hashtag idea, and so on just to give you an idea. And we can give this span a class name equal to font-normal. If we save this, there we go. And then we also have to provide a space right here. There we go. So we have the AI prompt and then we have the tag. Now, this is not gonna be a text area. It's gonna be an input because it's only one tag. We can put the value as post.tag we can put the own change as equal, but we just have to change the prompt to tag right here. Placeholder is going to be hashtag tag like this. It's going to be required and it's going to be form underscore input. If we save this, we have a great looking form that looks great on mobile devices right now, as we can see it, but it also grows to be a great desktop looking post. Finally, we need a button to cancel it or to post it. So below this label, we wanna create a new div that's going to have a class name equal to flex dash end, margin X, meaning left and right of three, margin bottom of five, and then gap of four. Inside of there, we can have a link and that link is going to say cancel. 
Of course, every link has to have an href. So we can set the href to just forward slash, meaning it's going to go back. And the class name can be text-gray-500 and text-sm or small. There we go. We have a nice cancel button there. And below the cancel button, we can also create a new button that's going to be of a type is equal to submit. It's going to have a disabled property. So if we are currently submitting, it has to be disabled. The button itself can check whether we are currently submitting. And if we are, we can say type dot dot dot. So if it's edit, it's going to be edit dot dot dot. Or if it is create, it's going to be create dot dot dot. Else we can simply render the type, which means that it's going to say edit or create. Right now we have create. Wonderful. Now we can also style it a bit by giving it a class name equal to px of five padding horizontal, py of 1.5. That's going to give it a bit of padding, text dash sm for small, bg dash primary dash orange, rounded dash full, and text dash white. And we have a great looking call to action button. This means that if we actually try to submit it, it should work, but it will not yet, even though the form is fully complete. So we have the form component done and you'll see how powerful this is because we'll be able to reuse it later on. But for now, we can go back to the page, see how our form looks like right now, but the functionality is not yet done. So we simply have the create prompt, which right now doesn't do anything. To make our create prompt function work, first we have to call the e.preventDefault. This is going to prevent the default behavior of the browser when submitting a form, which is to do a reload. In React and Next.js applications, we want that more native feel. We want the least amount of reloads as possible. So we definitely want to put that here. After that, we want to turn on the set is submitting to true because we can use that as some sort of a loader later on. And then finally, we want to focus on creating our first prompt. So to do that, let's create a new try and catch block. In the catch, we have the error. And how do we do it? Well, we have to call some kind of an API, right? So we can say const response is equal to await fetch. And then we want to pass the API we want to call. We're going to call the API that we will create. It's going to be under forward slash API, forward slash prompt, and then forward slash new. And we can pass the options object where the method is going to be post. And then the body that we're going to pass in is going to be json.stringify, an object where we're going to pass the prompt equal to post.prompt. We're going to pass the user ID equal to session dot user dot ID, we have to check if we do have the session. And then finally, it's going to be a tag post dot tag. So we're passing all of this data that we have right here in our front end to this API endpoint using a post request. Then we want to check if response dot okay. In that case, we can simply call router dot push to forward slash, meaning homepage. In the catch, we want to console log the error to see what's happening. And then we can also add a finally clause, which is going to happen either way or set submitting to false. There we go. Great. So the front end part of creating our app is done. We have this API call put in place. But now is the time that we create our API endpoint. And for this, you would need a separate backend developer back in the old days, you would have to create a new backend server, express routes, controllers and all of that good stuff. But now you can do that immediately. Keep in mind, this is the API you want to call. I taught you how you can create your own API endpoint in the crash course of this video. This is what we need to do. Go to your Explorer, go within the app and then API folder, create a new folder within the API folder called prompt. 
Now you should have to, you should have auth and prompt. Please ensure that is the case. And then within the prompt, we wanna create a new folder called new. And within the new, we wanna create a new file called route.js. So if you open it, it should say here, app API prompt new, and then the route. So if you expand it, it's going to look like this. Finally, we talked about how to create a new route. The only thing you do is say export, const, specify the route type. In this case, it's going to be a post route. Make it into an async rec and res function. And that's it. You write your code right here. In this case, we immediately get some things through. First, we wanna grab the things that we have passed through the post request, and we can do that by saying const user ID prompt and tag is equal to await rec.json, like this. And I don't even think we'll need to use the rest in this case. Finally, we need to connect to the DB. So what we can say is we can say import, use that utility function we have created called connect to DB. And it's coming from at utils forward slash database. Then we can open up a new try and catch block where we can await connect to DB. Once we're connected, we wanna create a new prompt. But unfortunately, we didn't yet create the model for the prompt. So let's go ahead and do that right away by going to models and creating a new prompt.js file. As before, we can import mongoose as well as schema, model, and models coming from mongoose. Then we can say const prompt schema is equal to new schema. We call it as a function and pass in an object. We wanna specify the creator of a specific prompt. It's going to have a type equal to mongoose.schema.types.object ID. So the creator is going to be a document in the database, more specifically the user type. And now that I look at it, we don't have to import mongoose as we already have the schema right here. Now we have to create a reference. Ref is going to be to the user. So it's going to be a one-to-many relationship. One user will be able to create many prompts. Next, we're gonna have the prompt itself, which is going to be a type of string, and it's going to have required set to true, but we also wanna have a message that's going to say prompt is required. Finally, we're gonna have a tag for one specific prompt that's going to be of a type is equal to string, required is going to be set to true, and we can say tag is required. At the end, we can do the same thing we did with the users by saying const prompt is equal to either get the prompt that already exists on the models object by saying models.prompt, or if it doesn't exist, create a new model that's going to be called prompt based on the prompt schema. And we can export default prompt. Great, now our mongoose and mongodb know how the documents in the database should look like, which means that we can go back to our new prompt route and we can import right here, prompt coming from add models forward slash prompt. Then like we created a new user, we can create a new prompt by saying const new prompt is equal to new prompt, we pass in the creator, which is equal to user ID, as well as the tag. There we go. Just to make it more readable, we can do it in a new line. We pass the creator and the tag. Finally, we wanna call await new prompt dot save to save it to the database. And then we can return new response with a capital R where we're gonna stringify json.stringify the new prompt and we can specify the status of 201. I'm gonna now expand this just a bit further so you can see it in one line. This is how an API route in Next.js looks like. 
you can immediately extract all of the data that you pass through the post request. And I can see we're not using the most important part, which is the prompt. So I want to add that right here to the new prompt. We connect to the DB. We have to do this every time because this is a Lambda function, meaning it's going to die once it does its job. So every time that it gets called, it needs to connect to the DB, do its thing, and then go in peace. Finally, we create it and then we return a new response and specify the status of 201, which means created. If we get an error, then we can return a new response that's going to say failed to create a new prompt and it can be a status of 500, means server error. Great. Now the functionality to create a prompt is done, which means that if we reload our page, we should be able to test it out. Let's try to think of a good one to start off. Something like, you are a professional web developer. I'm going to provide you with a snippet of code and you can give me advice on how to make it cleaner, more readable, and more efficient. This is, if I may say so myself, a pretty good prompt. There we go. So this allows us to share this prompt. And even if I hover it, my Grammarly just wants to sound more personable to the AI. So why not? We're not going to say I'm going to give it. We're just going to say, please give me some advice on how to make it that way. Great. We've got to be careful what we're saying to the AI. Uh, but hey, this is now a great looking AI prompt. And I'm sure other people, uh, maybe yourself, later on when you use this app, are going to find it useful because you can type this into your chat GPT and you can get value out of it. And the tag can be maybe hashtag web development. And let's click create. I click create, but not a lot has happened. Let me open up the terminal and click it again. Still nothing. So let's go ahead and check the create button. That's going to be within our form. Inside of our form, the form is submitting. We call the handle submit, which we pass through props to the form. So now let's go to the create prompt. And we are passing our create prompt as handle submit right here. And then if it's successful, we should be able to push to the home page. But that doesn't seem to happen right now. So let's go ahead and open up the console. And we do have an error, session is not defined. So inside of here, we're using the session to connect the currently logged in user to that prompt they're creating, but we haven't yet imported it. And we also haven't imported the router either. So this is a rookie mistake from my end. What we can do is we can get the router by saying const router is equal to use router like this. And then we can get the session by saying const data, rename it as session is equal to use session. Now, unfortunately, I lost my great prompt, so I'll have to write something similar again, so bear with me. I'm going to give you a piece of code and you tell me how I can make it cleaner, more readable, and more efficient. And we can use a tag, web development. Create. There we go. We are back on our homepage and apparently nothing seems to have happened because our feed is currently empty, which is completely normal because if you think about it, if we go all the way to our homepage, we are rendering the feed component, but the feed itself is nothing. So if we have successfully created our prompt, our next job is going to be to display it properly. So we can now go to our database and reload it to check whether we have really created a new prompt in the database and it appears as we have. There we go. I'm going to give you a piece of code, tell me how to make it more optimized, web development created by this specific object ID. It starts with 645 and if I compare it with my user account, it also starts with 645. So we know that is working and we have a one-to-many relationship. Wonderful. 
Finally, we're gonna see how all of these CRUD operations come to life once we now make a GET request to get all of the prompts to show in our feed. So that's going to be our next job. To start creating our feed, we're gonna first import the use state as well as the use effect hooks coming from React and immediately turn this into a client component. Then we're gonna also import one and only component we'll use in this file and that's the prompt card component coming from dot slash prompt card. And with that, we can immediately start with the JSX part of our feed. So we're gonna turn it into a section that's going to have a class name equal to feed. Inside of there, we're gonna have a form that's gonna be for the search of our feed. And that form is going to have a class name equal to relative w-full for full width and flex-center. Immediately inside of the form, we're gonna have a self-closing input tag that's going to have a type is equal to text. It's going to have a placeholder equal to search for prompts, or rather let's say search for a tag or a username. So we can search whatever we want. We're gonna give it a value, which is going to be something like search text. This is a state we'll have to create. An on change equal to handle search change. This is a function we have to create. It's going to be required and it's going to have a class name equal to search underscore input, and then also peer like this. Now, if we save this, it's going to give us an error saying that we don't have that state declared. So immediately we can create a new use state at the top. That use state is going to be called search text and set search text at the start set to an empty string. And we can also declare that handle search function. So const handle search change, which is going to get an event and it's going to look like this for now. And immediately we have a great looking search. Just below it, we can render our prompts, which is what actually matters. And right below, we of course wanna show our prompts. So we can render a new component called prompt card list. This is going to be a self-closing component, which is going to accept data. For now can be an empty array and it's going to accept a handle tag click, which for now can be set to an empty callback function. Now this prompt card list is a component that's only going to be used within this specific feed. So we can create it right here above our functional component. Const prompt card list is equal to an arrow function that accepts the data and handle tag click and it's going to immediately return a div. That div is going to have a class name equal to MT16 for margin top and prompt underscore layout. If we save this, we should be able to see nothing in here, but now we actually can map over the data and show some cards. But of course, we first need to fetch the data. So from our feed, we'll have to make a get request to our own Next.js API. To do that, we can create a new use effect and we're gonna have a callback function and we wanna call it at the start, initially as soon as the page loads. There, we can create a new function, const fetch posts is equal to an async function where we get the const response by saying equal to await fetch forward slash API forward slash prompt. Then from the response, we can get data by saying const data is equal to await response.json. And then we can update our state with all the posts by creating a new use state field called posts, set posts at the start set to an empty array. And below we can say set posts is equal to data. The fetch post function for it to actually do anything so we can do it right here within the use effect. Great. 
that should update our posts, which means that we can take those posts and pass them instead of this empty array into the prompt card list as prompts. Great. And it's not going to be prompts, it's going to be posts. So my bad right here. Now we have those posts passed over as data. So we can take that data in our list and say data.map, we get each individual post or prompt, however you want to call it. And for each one, we want to immediately return a self-closing prompt card component. To that component, we want to pass a key equal to post dot underscore ID. We want to pass the actual post itself. And we want to pass a handle tag click function. Now, the reason why we're still not seeing anything is because even though we're calling this API endpoint, we haven't yet created it. But thankfully, you know how easy it is to do that using Next.js. So we know we need API prompt, and it's a get request. So let's just go to our API prompt. And immediately inside of here, we can create a new route.js, not within the new, but just within the prompt. There, we'll have to import the same things as we did here. That's going to be the connect to DB and prompt. So we can copy those and paste them here. Then we need to say export const get is equal to an async function where we get the request. And we can call a try and catch block. Immediately in the try, we have to connect to our DB by saying await connect to DB. And then we have to filter out our prompts. And we can do that by saying const prompts is equal to await prompt.find. We can find all posts. And then we can populate the creator in there as well to know who created it. Finally, we have to return a new response, passing the json.stringify. And we can pass the prompts and return a status of 200. We can do a similar thing for the error by saying simply a string right here, failed to fetch all prompts, and it can be a status of 500. If we save this, it's going to compile successfully, and we can reload our page. And there we go, a prompt card appeared. That means that it is that easy to create and fetch the data using Next.js. The only thing we have to do now is go into the prompt card and actually display the prompt alongside the user that created it. To do that, we can first make this a use client component because we'll be using some states. We can import the use state hook coming from React. We're going to display an image so we can import the optimized image tag coming from next forward slash image. We can also import the use session coming from next auth react. And finally, we're going to import some new things such as the use path name alongside use router coming from next forward slash navigation. We already know that our prompt card is going to accept some props. And these are going to be the post as well as handle tag click. Later on, once we show this card, we'll also be able to delete it and edit it. So we can immediately accept those as well, handle edit, and handle delete. And we can dive into creating the JSX of our card by wrapping everything in a div and giving it a class name equal to prompt underscore card. That should change the look a bit. Well, not yet because it's empty. So let's create an inner div that's going to have a class name equal to flex justify dash between items dash start and gap dash five. We're just creating some space for the items that are yet to come. Inside of there, we can have a div and that div is going to contain the image of the author that created it. So it's going to be a self-closing Next.js image tag with a source SRC equal to pose that creator dot image. It's going to have an alt tag equal to user underscore image, a width 
of about 40 pixels and the height of about 40 pixels too. And we can make it rounded by giving it a class name equal to rounded full and object dash contain. If we save this, you can see JavaScript mastery created one and only prompt that we have so far. Now we want to make this card clickable, or at least the profile clickable. So we can give this div a class name equal to flex dash one, flex, justify dash start, items dash center, gap dash three, and cursor dash pointer to indicate that it is clickable. Now below this image, we can also render a div. That div is going to have a class name equal to flex and flex dash call. And there we want to show the person that created it. So we can give it an H3 and there we can render the post dot creator dot username. And below that we can render a P tag that's going to have post dot creator dot email. If we save this, you can see JavaScript mastery and JavaScript mastery 00 at gmail.com. So now let's style these a bit further by putting them in a new line and giving the H3 a class name equal to font dash Satoshi, font dash semi bold, and text dash gray dash 900. That's looking a bit better. Finally, let's give a P tag a class name equal to font dash inter, text dash SM, and text dash gray dash 500 to indicate that email is less important than the actual username. Now, this does look a bit big, but that's because I'm on 125% zoom. So if I do it like this, it's going to look more like it. Now, below this div and below one more div, we can create a div for the copy button and the actual prompt. So the class is going to be class name, copy underscore BTN. And on click, we can render just a callback function for now, which is empty. Later on, we're gonna implement the real logic. Inside of here, we wanna show a button to copy that actual prompt. That's going to be an image that's going to have a source equal to. Now it's gonna depend whether the post has been copied already. And for that, we'll have to have some kind of a state. So scrolling up, we can create a new state, use state called copied and set copied. At the start, set to an empty string. So if we scroll down, we can check if copied is triple equal to the current post that prompt. If that is the case, in that case, we can render the assets icons tick.svg and then else we can render assets icons copy SVG. So that's going to give us this icon. And of course we have to give it a width of 12 and height of 12 to be able to see it. There we go. So later on, once we implement the logic, once you click it, you'll get a confirmation that you actually copied whatever is in the prompt. Wonderful. Now below this div and below one more div, we're going to create a P tag. This P tag is going to render the post that prompt the most important part. And below that we want to render another P tag that's going to render hashtag post dot tag web development. Oh, I added a tag immediately in the actual tag. So I have a double tag now. So in this case, I can remove it from here. Now let's style this a bit better by giving this a class name equal to my dash four to divide it from the top and bottom by giving it a margin font dash Satoshi text dash SM text dash gray dash 700. Okay, this is looking a bit better. And we can style the tag by giving it a class name equal to font dash inter text dash SM blue underscore gradient and cursor dash pointer. There we go. Finally, we can give it an on click as well, because later on 
we'll be able to click on a specific tag and see all related posts. So that's going to be a function that's going to check if the handle click exists. And if it does, we can handle tag click. And we want to pass in the tag we want to click, pose.tag. Of course, the handle click is also supposed to be handle tag click. So what is this going to ensure? It's going to ensure that we do have the tag. If we do, we'll be able to click it and then we'll show all the relevant similar tags. Great. And this is it. This is everything we need for now. Later on, of course, we'll add the ability to edit and delete post if it's being shown on the profile. But for now, we're just on the home page and we just want to read everybody's great posts and maybe even copy them. So while we're here, let's also implement the copy to clipboard functionality. For that, inside of the copy, we can call the handle copy function. And above, we can create it. It is as simple as saying const handle copy is equal to a arrow function. And then we can set copied to pose.prompt. So we're going to update it. We want to do a navigator dot clipboard dot write text. And we want to pass the pose.prompt. And then we want to reset the state by giving it some timer. Set timeout with a callback function that's going to reset the set copied after about 3000 milliseconds or about three seconds. So if we now save this and click it, you can see a check mark and it is actually copied to clipboard, which means you can paste it somewhere more specifically in your chat GPT to immediately make use of this prompt. Wonderful. With that, two of our four CRUD operations have been done. The create post, which we can do right now by going to here and create prompt and read all prompts. So create and read. Now what's left to do is update and delete. And we'll be able to add update and delete once we implement our own profile. Right now, the profile is just a 404. But as you know, in Next.js, it is so easy to add a new front end route. We can do that by going to app and then simply creating a new folder called profile, inside of which we can create a new page.jsx and run RAFCE. And we can call it profile. Same thing for the component and the export. As soon as we do that and reload the page, you can see our new profile and the shared navigation bar. Great. Let's start with the profile page. To start off, we can immediately turn this component into a use client component because we're going to import use state as well as use effect hooks coming from React. We're going to also import the use session to know whether we are currently logged in. And we're going to get that from the next dash auth forward slash react. And finally, we need a router to navigate back to home. So we can get the use router hook coming from next forward slash navigation. Finally, we're going to also create a special profile component, which we'll be able to reuse later on. So that's going to be import profile from components forward slash profile, and make sure to add the add sign in front. Immediately on our profile, we'll be able to render that self closing profile component, which we are about to create, it's going to contain a name, we want to know whose profile are we seeing. And that's the primary reason why we're creating this separate component, because it can be my profile, but it can also be somebody else's profile. So in this case, the name is going to be my my profile. Later on, I'm going to show you how to reuse this component to create somebody else's profile. Then we have a DESC or description, we can say something like welcome to your personalized profile page. Below, we can have the data, which is going to be an array of our posts. We're going to have the handle edit functionality to edit the post. And we're going to also have the handle delete functionality to handle the delete of the posts. So let's create those functions right now. So we can pass them over to that page. 
To be able to create them, we first need the const handle edit is equal to a function that looks like this. And then we also need the const handle delete. In this case, it's going to be an asynchronous function that we're going to use later on. So now we can pass the handle edit as well as the handle delete to our profile component. Now for the data, we have to fetch the data and we already have the API endpoint to fetch it, but we have to modify it just slightly because now we don't want to fetch all the posts like we do on the feed. We want to fetch only the ones belonging to this specific profile. So first of all, let's fix this error by renaming our component to my profile, just so it doesn't clash with the component name. So we have const my profile here, and then the profile at the top. And then also the handle delete, it looks like I misspelled it. So if I fix it, we should be good. Great. Now, as I said, we can reuse what we had on the homepage or rather in the feed page. So if we go into the feed here, we do fetch posts. So we can copy this entire use effect, go back to my profile and paste it here. Const fetch posts is async response await fetch API. But this time we want to go to users forward slash, and then we want to make this a dynamic template string where we're going to search for session question mark dot user dot ID forward slash posts. So we only want to get the post from that specific user. And of course, for that to work, we have to get that session. So we can say const data renamed to session is equal to use session. There we go. So we're getting that data. And we of course want to create our posts. And we can do that by creating a new use state called posts, set posts, which is the start going to be equal to an empty string. And then we are updating the data right here. And then when do we want to fetch posts? Well, we only want to fetch them if we have the session question mark dot user dot ID. So we only want to fetch them if we have the user we want to fetch them for. That is great. And then we can reference the data equal to posts right here. Now, of course, we haven't yet created the API endpoint for this route, but it's going to be really similar to fetching old posts. So we can open up the file explorer, go to the API, create the new folder called users. Then we can create a new dynamic route of ID. And then within it, we can create a new folder called posts. And within it, we can create a new route.js. That route is going to be incredibly similar to our regular get all posts route, which is going to be within the API. And then where is it? It's within prompt route. There we go. So this is just a regular get route. We want to take that, paste it right here and modify it to fetch the posts only from a specific creator. So through this request, we're going to also pass some additional params right here. Those params get populated if you pass dynamic variables into the URL, such as this one right here. So if you look into the route, you can see that we have the ID as a dynamic parameter, which means that we're going to have access to something known as two params dot ID, as simple as that, right? So where do we want to use it? Well, in the find right here, we want to say creator is equal to params dot ID. And this is only going to get us the posts from that specific creator. That's great. And with that, our route is done. What we can do is go back to this page, our fetch works, our functions work, and we can move into our reusable profile component to get all of these parameters and show a profile page. So let's control click it and start implementing not the profile page, but the reusable profile component. Inside of here, we can also import the prompt card we created before coming from that slash prompt card. We can get all the props that we passed, such as name, description, or DESC, data, handle edit, and handle delete. 
and we can create it by first wrapping everything in a section and giving it a class name equal to w dash fool. We can immediately have an h1 right here that's going to say name and then profile. In this case, that's going to be my profile because we are on our own homepage. So let's save that, reload the page, and it still says profile, even though we are on the localhost profile. So let's see why that is the case. If we go into our routes, we can see that we have a profile and then the page, which renders the name as my profile. And there we render the H1. But I don't see an H1 here. So I am a bit confused. It does seem like I have a typo right here. But if we open up the terminal, it does seem like we have an error. Handle delete is not defined. That is at my profile. So if we go to my profile right here, we have a handle delete and it seems to be defined properly. So you know what, let me just simply restart the terminal and start it one more time. Even the best Next.js 13 sometimes maybe make some mistakes. So let's check it out. Whenever you're getting something that doesn't seem right, just restart your terminal just to be sure. So we're going to wait until it is compiled and we're going to check it out then. And there we go. We were right. It's saying my profile now, which is much better. So we can continue working on it by giving it a class name equal to head underscore text and text dash left. Now, even though I saved it, it didn't seem to have applied the changes. So I'm guessing there is some kind of a change with this profile component. Let's see, we are importing that profile from that slash components profile, and then displaying it right here. But the changes are not live saved, which is really weird. So even if I start typing something like test right here and save it, it does say compiled, but on the profile page, the changes are not actually there. This is really interesting. Could it be that I wasn't signed in? So maybe it wasn't giving it. Let's check it out. I'm going to sign in one more time and I'm going to go to our profile. And still, as you can see, it doesn't say this test right here, even though I saved the file. So sometimes next 13 can be buggy. It still is in the beta version, depending on when you're watching this video. But even though there are these little bugs, I still believe it is the future with all the new features we discussed today. It's great. So what can I do is I can develop this page fully, and then we're going to restart the terminal to see the changes. Um, this H1, or specifically the text within the H1 is also going to be wrapped in a span element. So we can put it right here at the end and give it a class name equal to blue underscore gradient. Below that H1, we can also have a P tag that's going to render the description and it's going to have a class name equal to DESC text dash left. And finally, we have to map over the cards. I think we can do that by copying the feed. So if we go into the feed, into the prompt card list, we just need to get this div that goes over the prompt cards. So we can copy that prompt card list div and paste it right below the P tag. That's going to give us a div. We want to modify the margin top a bit to 10. We want to map over the posts pass over the key and the post. But this time, instead of handle click, we're going to have the handle edit functionality, which is going to be equal to if handle edit exists, meaning handle edit and end, then we want to call the handle edit function and pass in the post. And we want to do the same thing for handle delete, where we have a callback function where we check if the handle delete exists, and then we call it by passing a specific post. Now, this is going to be it for the profile component, which means that I can now close it, go back here, and I can restart our server. And hopefully the changes are applied right now. And we're going to have the live reload working for the rest of the project.
And there we go. We can see my profile. Welcome to your personalized profile page. But unfortunately, we don't see our actual post. So how can that be? Well, it seems like we aren't sign in. So if I press sign in one more time, and then go to my profile, we can see the post by JavaScript mastery, which corresponds to our currently logged in user. That is great. Now we can add the remaining CRUD functionalities such as handle edit and handle delete. To be able to do that, we need to go into the profile and then into the prompt card because now we're passing two new additional functions. So inside of the prompt card, if you scroll all the way to the bottom, below the P tag, we can check if we have a session question mark dot user dot ID and if that is equal to to the post that creator dot ID and if the path name is triple equal to forward slash profile and only then do we show a div with those buttons. So what are we doing here? We're checking if the currently logged in user is the creator of that post and if they are on the profile page. If that is the case, we can show a div. That div is going to have a P tag that's going to say edit. And we can have another P tag below. That P tag is going to have a class name equal to font dash enter text dash SM green underscore gradient and cursor dash pointer to make it clickable. But more importantly, on click, it's going to handle edit. And now we can duplicate this P tag one more time below rename this to delete, rename the function to handle delete, and change it to instead of green gradient to orange gradient. If we save this, you can see that we don't have access to the session right here, which means that we have to import it at the top. So as we usually do, we can say const data, rename it as a session is equal to use session. And we also need to get the current path name by saying const path name is equal to use path name. And we also want to get the router by saying const router is equal to use router. Now if we scroll all the way down, we should have everything we need. So if we go back to the homepage and revisit our profile, you can see that we have a profile card, but we don't seem to have the two buttons that we just created. That's because the creator doesn't have an ID, they have an underscore ID, as that's how Node.js saves those buttons. And now we can see the two buttons appear right here. Let's just position them a bit better by giving this div a class name equal to MT5 for margin top to divide them from the tag, a flex center, a gap dash four to divide them from each other, border dash T for top border, border dash gray dash 100, and then padding top of three. And now we have edit and delete. Now, if we go all the way back to where we're passing that original handle delete function, that's going to be in the profile, but more specifically in the profile page. So we are yet to add the logic and the functionality for the handle edit and handle delete functions. Before we implement the front end for these, let's go ahead and add the API endpoints that we can then call. For edit, it's going to be inside of API prompt, and then we have to know the ID of the prompt we're working with. So that's going to be the dynamic ID parameter. And then within it, we can add a new route.js. That route is going to have three different types of requests. It's going to have a get to be able to read that request. It's going to have a patch to be able to update it. And then finally, it's going to have delete to delete it. So for the get, we can go to our prompts and then simply copy everything we have right here to speed up the process and then paste it right here. We get two different imports, which we're going to need later on. And then we get the export const get. In this case, we do have that extra parameter 
of ID. So right here as the second parameter, we can get the params object. We can have a try block connect to database. And then instead of prompts, we want to get one individual prompt that we want to find by ID. So find by ID. And then we want to pass in the props or rather params dot ID. If a prompt doesn't exist, so we can say if no prompt, we can then return a new response of prompt not found status 404. Otherwise, we can return a json.stringify prompt and then a status of 200, else a 500. This is our get to be able to read one specific prompt. Finally, we can collapse this because we're going to need two more. We're going to say export const patch is going to be equal to an async function where we get the request and we get the params. Then we want to get the data we passed for the update. We are going to pass a prompt and a tag, and then we can get those by saying await request.json. We're going to have a try and catch block one more time. First things first, we want to await connect to DB. So we want to connect to the database first. Afterwards, we want to find the existing prompt. So const existing prompt is equal to await prompt dot find by ID. And we can pass in the params dot ID. Once again, if a prompt doesn't exist, so if no existing prompt, we can return new response prompt not found status 404. Once we're sure we have a prompt, we can update it by saying existing prompt dot prompt is equal to the new prompt that we passed through params. And then we can also update the tag by saying existing prompt dot tag is equal to tag. Once we have updated it, we can simply await existing prompt dot save. And then we need to return a new response by stringifying the existing prompt and passing over a status of 200. If something goes wrong, we can return new response, fail to update the prompt with a status of 500. The endpoint for the update is done as well. Feel free to pause this video and ensure you got everything right. The file for the route is also going to be in the GitHub just down below. So if you have any typos, you can simply copy and paste it to ensure that everything works. And finally, we have the delete route. Delete is not going to be that tough. We also have to export const delete. That's going to be an async where we get a request and we also get some params. I think you can start noticing the pattern. Once you know how things work, you can get the hang of it and you can build anything you want. If I just did that crash course that you watched at the start, you would know that these concepts exist, but you wouldn't know how to do them. But now that you've done this, building a real CRUD application, you can actually put it in practice for your own future applications, or at least refer to this video to be able to build it. And that's exactly what we teach in our JSM Masterclass experience. It is a six month bootcamp where we teach you how to become a software engineer and we have a crazy guarantee where I say, if you don't manage to land a job within six months of graduating, you're going to get 100% money back, no questions asked. So we're that sure that I can help you become a great developer. So if you like these videos, just imagine what you could get with real mentoring by real expert mentors such as myself and everybody else that's helping to build these applications for YouTube. Great. With that said, we can proceed with the delete route. It's going to be a try and catch block. First, we want to await connect to DB as we always do. Then we need to find the prompt by ID and remove it. So there's a special function await prompt that find by ID and remove all in one. And we need to pass the params that ID. Finally, we can return a new response saying prompt deleted successfully, and we can return also a new error 
If it fails, failed to delete prompt, status 500. And with that, we have created three additional endpoints that we can now call from the front end side of our application. Wonderful. Now we can get back to our page and we can continue calling these endpoints right from the front end side of our code. Crazy enough, all from the same full stack development environment called Next.js. Before we weren't able to do that, now we can. So let's handle the edit first. The only thing we wanna do here is not edit it immediately. We wanna navigate the user to a page where they can edit it in a nice way, where they have the form environment. So we're gonna say router.push. Oh, I can see that we don't have the router imported yet. So what we can do is say const router is equal to use router. And then in the handle edit, we can say router.push to a dynamic route of forward slash update dash prompt, question mark ID is equal to post dot underscore ID. So now if we save this and if we click the edit button, we're gonna get an error, which is okay, saying that post is not defined. So if we look into that right here, we have to pass the post through the handle edit function. And same thing is going to happen for the handle delete. When we're calling them, we're passing that post so we can simply reference to it. And now if we click it, it's going to go to the update prompt. But as you can see, it's a 404. But for you, that's not a problem. You can simply go to your app and you can create a new folder called update-prompt and create a new page.jsx file inside of it. Now, here's the catch. Remember that create prompt page that we did? It looked something like this. I told you that inside of there, we're using a special form component that we made to be reusable. Now I'm going to show you how we're going to come from create post to edit post immediately. First, you can copy the entire create prompt page and paste it into the update prompt. Let's change the name to the export to edit prompt, of course, and change it right here in the name, edit prompt. The difference between the edit prompt and the create prompt is that with the create, you don't have any data right here available. But with the create prompt, we need to be able to get the previous data of that prompt to be able to update it. So for that reason, inside of the edit, we're going to add an additional use effect hook that's going to look like this. It's going to happen whenever the prompt ID changes and that prompt ID we can get through the request query because when you go to update prompt, you will have a special forward slash ID right here. So to get to that ID, we can import something known as use search params coming from next navigation. And we're of course also going to need the use effect. And in this case, we won't need the use session. Now that we have the search params, here's how we use them. Const search params is equal to use search params. And then you can say const prompt ID is equal to search prompts dot get ID. Now, based on that, we can create a new const get prompt details function equal to an async function where we get the response by calling our own endpoint await fetch dynamic string of API prompt and then prompt ID. We created it. This is the first of the three endpoints we created recently. Out of the response, we can get our data by saying const data is equal to await response.json. And once we get it, we can simply set the post data. Set post is equal to prompt is equal to data.prompt and tag is equal to data.tag. Finally, we only want to call this function if prompt ID exists like this.
There we go. So now, if we go back to our profile, and if we click edit, we'll be re-navigated, but we'll have to remove this use session tag because we're no longer using that. And also for now, we can comment out the create prompt as we're not using the create prompt. And right here, we can just put this as an empty callback function for now. If we now save all of these changes, we can see our create post and it automatically gets filled. This is what I was telling you about. We have the entire, what seems to be a create, but it's not. The only thing you have to do to make it edit is simply say edit right here. And it's going to change instantly. Edit right here, edit right here, edit right here. And it gives you all the data from that specific post you're trying to edit. The power of reusability in React is crazy. The only thing we have to do is exchange this create prompt function with the update prompt. So let's do just that. I'm going to uncomment it. We want to call it update prompt and also call it right here at the bottom. At the start, it's going to give us an error, which is fine. First, we want to check if no prompt ID, then we want to return an alert saying missing prompt ID or something like prompt ID not found. Else we can proceed. This time, we're not going to make a post request, rather, we're going to make a patch request. We're going to make a fetch to API prompt, but not new, rather, it's going to be under a specific prompt ID like this. So API prompt and then prompt ID. This is the second endpoint in the list of endpoints to be created. It accepts the prompt, but this time we don't need the user ID as we already know who created it. Finally, we're going to get the response and everything else can remain the same. Believe it or not, this is it. This is all that we had to do to switch our create into an edit. Great. With that said, we can go ahead and go back to the profile page one more time. Click edit. It's going to populate it. And let's change this from I'm going to give you to I will give you a piece of code. Let's say a snippet of code. And then again, Grammarly wants me to be more appreciative of it. So I'm going to change it. I will give you a snippet of code and I'd appreciate it if you could tell me how I can make it cleaner, more readable, and more efficient. Once again, let's be good to our AI. Who knows what it's going to be capable of in the future. And I'm going to remove this hash because we don't need to have the hashes here. And I'm going to click Edit. There we go. It brought us back to the feed. And you can see that our post got updated. That is it. The edit functionality now works as well. Let's go back into our prompt card just to modify this to also have that hash. So we can add the hash up front. There we go. This is looking great. So three out of four CRUD operations are now completed. The last one on our list is going to be the handle delete. Thankfully for our handle delete, we have already created the backend endpoint. We have it here. So the only thing we have to do is first check, is the user sure they want to delete it? So we can say const has confirmed is equal to a confirm prompt. And this is built into the browser API. And then we can pass the question. Are you sure you want to delete this prompt? If this variable ends up being true, we can say if has confirmed. In that case, we can open up a new try and catch block. Within the catch, we can simply console.log the error. And then within the try, we can await fetch and then make an API call to forward slash API forward slash prompt forward slash post dot underscore ID dot to string. So we want to ensure that it is stringified. And that is it. We, of course, want to pass the options object where the method is equal to delete. Finally, once that happens, 
we'll be able to get all the posts, but without the deleted post. So we can say const filtered posts is equal to my posts dot filter, where we get each individual post. And then we can check if post dot underscore ID is not equal to, well, we have to get the current post that we're trying to delete. So let's rename this post to just P, where we're looping over. So if P dot underscore ID is not equal to post dot underscore ID, and that's going to give us the posts, which we can then set to state by saying set posts filtered post. Great. Now let's go ahead and copy this one so we can later on reuse it. But for now, we want to go to the profile and delete it. So if I navigate to my profile and click delete, you can see this alert or rather a confirm that asks us if we want to delete it, we're going to say yes or okay. And then we are waiting and waiting, but nothing seems to have happened. We did get MongoDB connected, but the post is still here. So if we open up inspect element and go to the console, we can see images missing, that's okay. But we get my posts is not defined. So this right here was supposed to be just a regular state of posts and not my posts. That was my bad right here. Now if we save this, you can see that it disappears. And we no longer have any posts on our profile. If we go back to the home page, we also don't have any posts there. And profile is empty too. That's great. So let's quickly go back to create prompt. And let's just paste the one we already had, say something like web dev and create it one more time, just so we have something on the feed. Wonderful. And with that, we just proved that full CRUD capabilities of these applications work, we can create posts, view them, we can also update them if we are the creator. Finally, we can delete them straight from our profile. And we did all of this with the help of Next.js, both the front end side and the back end side. Now that all of the primary CRUD functionalities have been developed, I have a couple of tasks for you. Watching these videos can be a phenomenal way to learn. You get to see how code is being used and how projects are being created. But of course, you learn best while you implement new features on your own. As I mentioned before, that's what we encourage within our JSM Masterclass experience. There, you will have to develop your own projects, one huge project each month within a team with expert mentor guidance. But right here with this single free video, I wanted to give you a taste of what that might look like. Yes, it is true that you won't have me to teach you how to do it. But hey, you can give it a shot on your own. And that way you will be able to learn. So let me show you the features that you will have to implement. Right here, I have a finalized version of the application deployed. So let's explore the applications full functionalities. Let's sign in. Of course, we can see all of the posts from the different users. But we can also create our own prompts. Nothing new so far, right? Now, once we create this post, there's a couple of additional things that we can do in this deployed app that we cannot do at the current version of our app. One of those things is search. So for example, I can see that in here, this person is mentioning something like customer persona. So let's say that you're building your own customer persona, and you want to find all of the useful prompts that mention that word, we can simply start typing customer persona. And you can see that it shows us two different prompts with that thing. Also, we can search by different tags. So if I search for marketing, it's going to give me only the marketing posts. And you can also search by username. So if I start typing tidbits, it's going to show me all of the posts by the username tidbits. So there are three different types of search that I'm going to list right here. Search by prompt content, search by tag. So it's going to be prompt tag, and then search by username. Great. One additional thing that we implemented is that you can simply click on a tag to be able to see all of the prompts in that category. 
So if you click right here, it's going to automatically fill it in the search. Again, nothing special. If you make the search by tag work, the only thing you have to do is populate the input. So as you can see, that works as well. We can click coding, we can click blogging as well, and that works. So that is the second feature that you will have to implement. And then the last feature is to implement view other profiles. So if I hover over the photo, username, or the email, you can click it. And then that brings you to a special URL called profile forward slash ID of that profile and their name. So it no longer says my profile, it says tidbits.js profile. And then here you can see all of the specific prompts that this person has posted. In the same fashion, we can search for somebody else's profile and we'll be redirected there. So I hope that these three features make sense and that with all the knowledge that you gained throughout the crash course and throughout the current project build, you will be able to implement some of these features on your own. Of course, take your time and don't worry if you cannot get it to behave like the finished application. That's completely okay. Let me give you a hint on how you can implement some of these features. For the first and the second one, that is for the search and for the click on tag, the code for these features will have to be implemented within the feed component. So inside of here, you'll have to add some search states, such as search text, timeout, results, and then you'll have to filter the prompts based on those queries. Finally, you'll need to handle the search change, and also the function for the handle tag click is going to look something like this. So if at any point you get stuck with implementing the search, you can find the complete GitHub code repository in the description down below, and you can reference to it. Same thing goes for the third feature, which is to implement view other profiles. For this, you will have to create a new file or folder within the profile directory, dynamic ID, and then the page. This file is going to be incredibly similar to the old profile page that we have created, but this time it's just going to fetch posts from a different user and we're gonna reuse our existing profile component. I hope everything makes sense, but again, if you get stuck, the full finished code containing these features is going to be linked down in the description. And whether you decide to implement these features or not, I wanna teach you how you can deploy this project to the web. So you can deploy it right now with me, or you can pause this video, try to implement these features, and then deploy it later on with me. Either way is just fine because the application even right now is looking great. So let me teach you how you can deploy a new Next 13 modern application. First things first, let's go ahead and check out our file and folder structure. Inside of here, we can see that our .env is green, but it shouldn't be. We never wanna push a .env file to production. So we can simply add it right here under git ignore, and that should grade out. That is good. That means that it's not going to be pushed to git, but we can go ahead and create a new GitHub repository. So back on GitHub, you can scroll all the way to the top, click the plus button, and then click new repository. Feel free to choose any name for your repository. I'm going to do Project Proomtopia and make it public. Finally, click Create Repository. After that, pull this to the side and open up the integrated Visual Studio Code terminal and stop the application from running and clear it. Then run git init, git add dot, git commit dash first dash m first commit and then follow the commands from here git branch dash m main git remote add origin and then git push u origin master this is going to push your code to github and in just one second you can reload it and you should be able to see your code right here of course feel free to modify the readme add a screenshot Tell everybody what you built. Once you have it deployed, that's great. Now we can head to Vercel. Vercel is a company that owns Next.js. So of course, they have built it with Next.js in mind. They have built it in a way that you can immediately develop and build specific applications like we did today 
and then you can preview it. And finally, you can deploy it. They made this process so simple and so easy. And since they are the creators of Next.js, they made it so seamless that you immediately get all the benefits such as speed, SEO, global edge network, and then first party monitoring as well. So the only thing you have to do is go ahead and log in or sign up at the top, right? Do so with GitHub because that's where we put our project code. Somewhere within your dashboard, you should be able to find a button to create a new project. Most likely you won't have as many projects as I do, but all of these are projects from many different cohorts of the masterclass experience students that we teach. So every single one has their own deployment for their capstone and monthly projects. So in this case, you can scroll all the way up and click add new, and we want to add a new project. They make it so simple. You simply need to import a Git repository. And if you made it public, it should be right here. So you can click import. The root directory can be the same as well as the build and output settings. Of course, we have some environment variables, which we want to add. Regarding environment variables, we can add them once the project is deployed. So let's go ahead and click deploy. There we go. It is deploying right now and we can see the steps right here. And immediately we get a build error, which is okay. It happens. Right now we can see that it cannot resolve add components forward slash profile. That is coming in the profile page.jsx. So if we open up the page and check this out here, we can go to some different file, maybe the page and see how we're importing the feed feed. It's a capital F here, capital F here. And the component itself is of course in a capital letter. So in the case of our profile, unfortunately we used a lowercase P letter. So I'm going to bring this back to uppercase. It didn't break our build locally, but it looks like Vercel doesn't like inconsistency. So if we fix this, we can go ahead and run git add git commit dash M fix typo, and then git push. This is going to re push our repository, which means that it should auto build on the same project that you have opened. So right here, we can check it out. It says building fix typo. There we go. Duration 35 seconds. And there we go. It succeeded. So we can see everything went great. And if we click visit, you can see that our application is deployed on this URL. That is great. Now, of course, a couple of things won't work right off the bat. And that is, we can see that the sign in button is missing, which means that we haven't properly connected next auth nor Google. So let's do that together right away. Our application contained some environment variables that we need to fix for this to work. We of course had our Google ID, Google client secret, MongoDB URI, and we also have the next auth URLs. First of all, we'll have to update our next auth URL to this newly deployed URL. Of course, we cannot do it right here within our code. We have to do it within environment variables of our project. So let's click your project name right here. Go to settings, environment variables, and then you can add your environment variables one by one. So let's add our next auth URL, which is going to be equal to this URL. Let's also add another, which is going to be the next auth URL internal, also pointing to the same link. We can add a couple more. That's going to be next auth secret equal to this entire thing. Then we can have the MongoDB URI equal to this entire query string. Then we can have the Google client secret. And finally, the Google ID. There we go. All our environment variables are here and we can save them. Now, on top of that, there are a couple of additional checks that we have to make. First of all, we can go to MongoDB and then go to network access. And once again, ensure that you allowed access from all different endpoints right here. So you can click add IP address and somewhere here, it should say not only add current, but add all addresses. 
that's great. On top of that, we also have to update the callback URL within our console.cloud.google.com. So go to web client one, and then under authorized JavaScript origins, we need to add our new URL. So copy it and paste it here. We have to remove the slash, and we also have to add the redirects. So right here, I'm going to add the base one, as well as the one that's going to contain the forward slash API, forward slash auth, forward slash callback, forward slash Google, and you can click save. Now this could take a couple of minutes to refresh. But now if we go back and reload the page, if the environment variables have been set up correctly, and our Google now allows the callback, we should be able to see the button, but it's not there yet. So we need to ensure that our environment variables are there. It is possible that we might need to rebuild our application for the changes to take effect. So let's go to deployments, click on the latest build, click on three dots, and then click redeploy. And once again, confirm it. Deployment started, and our deployment should be done in about half a minute. Our application has now been deployed, and we can click visit. And there we go, we have our snippet which means that we're successfully connected to MongoDB and we have our sign in button, which means that we have properly added our environment variables. Let's go ahead and try to sign in. But this time it says that you can sign in because the app sent an invalid request. Okay, that's interesting. And here it says redirect URI mismatch. So that has to do with the callbacks that we have set right here. And if we look into it, the URL ends with OEX JS Mastery Pro. It's the same one. And then we also added what we need to add. That's going to be the forward slash API, forward slash auth, forward slash callback, forward slash Google. So this looks good to me. It does say that the changes could take five minutes, up to a few hours to take effect, but hopefully it's going to be sooner. And it looks like I just noticed that these two versions of the app don't match. So while we redeployed it, it also changed the URL. So we'll have to repass the updated URL to Google. So instead of this one, I'm going to pass the existing one. That is this one right here with 7z. There we go. I'm going to update that. And we are good to go. I'm going to save it. And hopefully this time it's going to take less than five minutes or a couple of hours. I'm going to reload our page and try to click sign in one more time. This time it did give me all the accounts I can sign in with. In this case, I use my personal account just to see if we can create another post with it. So let's go ahead and create a new prompt. Let's do something for blogging. So we can say I need a type of blog post that will provide valuable and relevant information to my ideal customer persona and persuade them to take the desired action. And we can say blogging. I'm going to create it. And there we go. We have Adrian, we have JavaScript mastery. And for now, I can just click here to go to my profile. But if you implemented the additional features, such as the search, and the click on other people's profiles and clicking on the tag, that should work as well. And before we wrap up this video, I wanted to talk to you about something really important. You see, creating these projects is just one part of the learning process, but it's equally important to share your work with others. Sharing your work online can help you in so many ways. First of all, it can help you build your portfolio. So if you're just starting out, having some projects to showcase can be a great way to demonstrate your skills to potential employers or clients. Sharing your work also gives you the opportunity to receive feedback and improve your skills. In addition, sharing your work can help you gain recognition. When you share your work on social media, other developers and enthusiasts can discover it and share it with their own followers, helping you get more exposure. Finally, sharing your work can potentially lead to job opportunities. Employers are always on the lookout for talented developers and sharing your work can help you stand out from the crowd. So I encourage you to share your work with us. Here's how you can do it. If you're on Twitter, 
You can share your project by tweeting the deployed project URL, GitHub code URL, screenshot or video and a brief description of the project to build. Don't forget to use the hashtag JavaScript Mastery and Proomtopia, as well as tag the JS Mastery Pro profile. If you're on LinkedIn, do the same thing. Share the screenshot or even a video of you going through the project you build and the additional features you implemented. Add a brief description. And of course, tag JavaScript Mastery, as well as Adrian, if you want to. Recently, one of her students share how they have built their 3D portfolio. It is a phenomenal build and it got almost 10,000 views. They shared what they've done as well as tagged who they learned it from and they also shared the GitHub link. This is going to provide this person so many opportunities and you can do the same. We have this great person that shared how they launched their own portfolio site and they also tagged JavaScript Mastery on Instagram. I can't wait to see what you'll create. So please share your projects and tag me on different social media channels. I will make sure to check every single one of your submissions. With that said, thank you so much for watching this video and coming to the end. You learned a lot about what Next.js 13 has to offer. If you want to explore our more in-depth courses, check out jsmastery.pro for a couple of phenomenal React and Next.js courses. And if you're serious about getting a job in tech, check out our JSM Masterclass experience, a six month bootcamp where you have expert developers at your disposal as your mentors. Once again, phenomenal job on building this project. I'll see you next time and have a wonderful day. Thank you.